Hello, welcome to the May 13th, 2022 Club Cubase live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test and then we'll go ahead and get started. So bear with me just for a moment. Hello, welcome to the All right, sounds like my monitoring computer is fine. My name is Greg Undo. I'm presenting, uh, I work as a product specialist, primarily focusing on Steinberg products on, in uh, the United States. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America and I'll be the host for the live stream today. Um, I'm based outside of Washington, D.C. area in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, so if you're watching this, uh, if you're watching the live stream, make sure that you uh, introduce yourself. If you're watching live, make sure you introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Um, and if you haven't attended a live stream before, how it works is you could send uh, questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Um, or you could just simply ask uh, questions in the live in the live chat field. Uh, when asking questions, uh, realize that my I will try my best to catch up to all of the questions. But if we could maybe uh, try to avoid uh, asking the same questions repeatedly, um, you know, if we don't if you don't see uh, like a, a particular answer. Uh, immediately, so because uh, if we kind of repeat questions at that point, um, it could take a little while to kind of go through a bunch of questions that may have been asked, or you know. So if we could avoid that, that would be appreciated. And when asking questions, if you could indicate if you're running Cubase LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, and which version number, like 10, 11, or 12, that information is helpful. In which operating system? We should have later tonight after the live stream, I'll go back and rewatch it and type up the index with timestamps of topics covered in the live stream. So we should have that uh, so you can look for that. But if you wanted to search for topics that have been covered um, from previous live streams, you may want to go to uh, cubaseindex.com. So you could do that. And Jan from Stockholm has created uh, sites for that. So you could use that as a wonderful resource. Another wonderful resource that we should point out is the Cubase Nation Discord. And Jazzdo does a lot of work compiling information that's really relevant and useful um, to, you know, that's, that's very relevant and useful for the Steinberg community. So we give special uh, thanks to Jazzdude for his work there. And we have two people that serve as moderators, Jazzdude and Agent K. They're not, uh, they're not Steinberg employees, but uh, they just kind of do this to help out in the community. So, and with that, we will go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, okay, so we see a uh, question. Uh, Hi, Greg. When using time warp, is there a modifier key that makes the point snap to grid lines when stretching? Uh, <clears throat> if so, anchor to the right and move the grid to the new left point to be snapped to grid. Okay. So let me just... Try doing this real quick. Okay, so let's say if we're doing our time warp tool here, so let's just make sure I'm in the right mode. So we'll say in our warp grid. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm not sure if this is with audio warping or, or like the grid warping, but if we want it to uh, just come, I think this might be with, uh, and you could just let me know if I'm mistaken, but if it's with like kind of the warp editing here. Um, all right, so it says that makes the point snap to the grid lines when stretching. So let's say if I just put in a couple of, hit points here. All right, and if I wanted these to stretch, so I think if we just have this set to uh, our grid here, that you could see that as we do this, <clears throat> it'll have like a little, it'll feel kind of like a bump, but as we do kind of stretching here, that we could just come over here and that will snap based upon the grid. So make sure that you have the snap turned on. Um, so in this way you could just say, okay, like I wanted this point to be snapped 
uh, right to measure 62. So as we do that, I could adjust that and that will just kind of fall. It's almost like a, you, as you move the mouse, it'll feel like you're kind of falling into like a little crack uh, right there. So let me know if that's what you mean uh, by that question, Alex, um, or if you wanted it. And if it was dealing you know, with the warp grid where we move uh, the warp events here, um, you know, this, we're actually kind of moving the particular, you know, measures to the events. So there's nothing for it to really snap to. Uh, but let me know if I misunderstood. Okay, so we see from uh, Bio Minerals. Hi, Greg, I can't audition the media bay. So let's come over here and say if we want to um, go through some different loops. Okay, so generally, because the media bay isn't, like these tracks aren't assigned to a particular track, they get routed through the control room. So let's say if we come over here um, and we go to your audio connections from your studio menu, at this point we could go to our control room and often what you do is take your main stereo output and have a stereo output or 5.1 output if you're doing surround have that kind of defined and choose not connected. And in the control room, you could add a monitor and connect your audio interface from your monitor. And then you should be able to just quickly audition uh, all of your different uh, tasks and samples right there. Okay. So we have a question, uh, is it true Cubase has now added batch freeze? So yes, you could come over here, select multiple tracks, and just like when we come over here uh, and we go to your edit menu, you could freeze selected tracks with the current settings or you know freeze selected tracks in addition to render in place. And there's key commands set up for that. So yes, that was added in 12.01. So long times uh, feature request that people wanted. So Steinberg put it in. They listen. Okay. Okay, so we see, um, so just see from KG Holly just saying, uh, would that not work when channels are grouped? And I'm trying to see if I could find what that was. Maybe a reference to something else. Sometimes when questions are answered ahead of time, it can, um, so maybe I missed that if it was put in before the start of the live stream. Sometimes those questions get lost, all right. So uh, maybe KG Holly, if you have a, a question uh, that maybe was is not in the chat field, uh, let me know. Okay, so did you see from uh, Roll Domination from uh, Souls, just saying I can make a, sh a shortcut key to track at hit points, possible to make a shortcut to slice at an offset amount, like slice button in a quantize panel, if not key command, a macro would be a big time saver. Um, so currently, I don't know of a way to trigger that with a key command. I did pass that along to Steinberg as a maybe a function that would be uh, added as a potential, you know, selectable function for remote control or, um, you know, or directly, you know, from... Uh, you know, within a macro defined keyboard shortcut. Okay, so we see, uh, asked about this before, still can't, uh, question, still can't find a way to export MIDI from hit points in a sliced up track after quantizing. Uh, big time waste to bounce track and reset all hit points to export MIDI. Um, 
So let's say if I just wanted to come here, let me just slice some audio going on. Okay, so we'll go to our hit points. So let's say we'll just adjust our threshold here and let's go ahead and let's say we've now created our slices. Um, all right, so to see if there's a way, let me just, all right, so once we've done that, so let's make sure I understand the order. Okay, so let's say we've now quantized. Okay, so let's say I quantize these. And now you want to have MIDI based upon the new hit points without having to bounce and re-slice. Um, so one thing that you might be able to do, just out of curiosity, is let's say um, I have all of these that I sliced. So let's say if I do this, um, so we have our hit points and what I want to do now is we'll, we'll create, uh, so let's go ahead and create our slices. And let's say before I do that, that I want to create MIDI notes And we'll just put this on a new MIDI track. Okay. And I'll move that MIDI track directly underneath. So now what I want to do, so if we double click here, we can see our MIDI. And at this point, let me uh, create slices. And let's say if I select both of these, and now I will quantize this let's say to eighth notes. That as we look at, so you could try to select, you know, both of you know, both the actual track here and the MIDI track and to quantize them uh, at the same time and see if that works. I could play around with it a little bit more if you want to send me an email to clubcubase at steinberg.de. I could check it out over the weekend, see if I come up with some type of macro to automatically do that. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Anne-Marie Heiser. Am I chat field just jumped on me. So let me see if I can get back. Um, I changed Cubase to my new laptop. It's working, but there is no sound. I tried everything from installing it again, putting every sample and loops to the library. Still can't record or hear any tips. Um, so if you could let us know what audio interface you're using. Um, so if it's going to be just, uh, so, you know, depending on if you're on Mac or PC, uh, so if I wanted to hear it through the built-in audio of my Mac, I would choose like built-in audio on the PC platform. We would choose uh, generic low latency. And then once we have that done, go to like the control panel and then you could have it automatically routed through, through like, you know, if you have an HDMI connection, if you wanted to hear it through the headphones or through speakers, 
Uh, you could set that, you know, once you go into the generic low latency uh, mode, you could tell it where in the operating system uh, to route the audio. If you have an audio interface, you should, you know, once the driver is installed, uh, you should be able to just select the audio interface directly here in the studio menu to studio setup and then just see the uh, ASIO driver uh, directly there. So, um, so let me know if which operating system you're using, Anne-Marie. And thanks for joining us on the live stream. All right, so see... Uh, Benny just asking if anyone has had experience with an Icon QCon Pro G2. So I think it just kind of works as Mackie control. All right, so we see John Costigan. He's gonna, he has a live sound setup tonight, so he has to bail a little early. Thanks for joining us. All right, and we have Rob from Tarpon Springs, Florida, just thanking us for doing these live streams. We see Jan from Stockholm. All right, we have Dejan from uh, Serbia joining us. Okay, so we see uh, when I question, when I shut down Cubase, it freezes a long time. How can I solve this? So sometimes what, you know, what some, sometimes, you know, there are many plugins that don't release uh, kind of their memory from the particular uh, audio interface. So it could be that maybe there's a plugin that's kind of stuck. What some people can do to kind of terminate that is maybe close the project before closing Cubase. And sometimes that can help free up the memory uh, when exiting when exiting the program. So All right. let me see, just had a, I think maybe a question just kind of came, got emailed in. Let's see if we can Okay, so we have a question from Michael Pierce. Uh, says, um, um, says, what might be required for the cross grade to Nuendo from Pro Tools 11? I was re uh, wondering if a screenshot of my iLock account might do it, but the way the shop is up, you can't really find out until you've got the final uh, purchase screen. I would love to add that to the arsenal. So yeah, you could definitely do that. Um, you know, give that a shot. I think, you know, that that should suffice. If not, you know, let me know, uh, but, and it says, uh, all right. And also Michael Pierce is saying uh, one of her, he's working with Ukrainian visitors, a film composer, and he's interested in switching to Cubase, so adding Nuendo and her set of tools might be quite cool. So yeah, I would definitely kind of uh, pop through and, and try that. And I think that would be sufficient for that. But um, let me know if you run into any problems, Michael. Okay. All right, so we have Theodore from Southeast London checking in. Thanks for joining us. We have Tron from Norway. Okay, so we have a question. Um, let's see from uh, Rob. What's the easiest way to take a pattern from Groove Agent and put it into a track in Cubase and extract the MIDI so it plays the same drum sounds? Okay, so let's come here. So probably the easiest way to do it is literally to drag and drop the actual uh, pattern preset over. So just open up a pr quick project and we'll show you. Okay. All right, so we'll come here. Let's say I have just a quick uh, groove agent pattern here. So if we have a pattern, um, so literally just drag and drop the pattern. And that's all you have to do. So I say, okay, now I want a fill. I want it to switch to this pattern, an intro, 
And now all you have to do is as you play back, it'll just kind of play these particular patterns. So. So we'll have a different pattern here. So that's all you have to do is literally just kind of just drag it and drop from the Groove Agent pad right into the product, right into the project. Another way of kind of doing it, if you want it, if you're doing variations that you want it to be captured, is to come over here. Let's set the input from Groove Agent. So as soon as we have this, we can say, okay, we'll have uh, the MIDI out. So if we solo this project, and let's say if I was playing a pattern here, I could just put Cubase into record. And this way, if I have different uh, pattern variations, I can just kind of come over here. And now all that information is just recorded directly into Cubase as if you're kind of playing it virtually. So you could also just drag and drop or just place Groove Agent as the MIDI input port and hit record on the track. All right, we see Jazz Dude and Agent K are the best. So that's good to know. We see Jean-Marie. So I have some time, Jean-Marie, maybe after the live stream, uh, about two o'clock your time, if you want to chat. So sorry, I wasn't able to get to your call. I had six meetings yesterday. All right, we see Samson Strike from Austria. All right, we see Mark Rabin. All right, so we see, um, all right, so we got from uh, Isaac. Uh, so just asking if I received the project that you sent. So I got everything working except for uh, the drums. Uh, I think it's like an addictive drums part. So let's say if I think this is the project here. Um, so I just kind of opened this one. And I think this is for kind of like a mixing tutorial. So I didn't get, you know, maybe this is uh, the WAV file that was missing. Maybe it was rendered, but I, I don't have the drums. So I have kind of everything but the drums, which I think are being routed out to maybe addictive drums or something like that. So if you have that particular file, um, we could probably visit a quick mixing thing on it on Tuesday's live stream. Okay. All right, so we see a uh, question. Should I power down my Mac Pro when I finish working on a project for a day? I often leave my computer on for days at a time when I continue working on a project. I try to save, I get a, uh, the beach. Um, so sometimes if you have time machine going on, um, you know, and you leave it on overnight, it may cause some issues uh, with time machine as it's trying to do like a backup to uh, to be uh, accessed later. So um, so if you don't have time machine, it should be fine. Uh, but a lot of I know for just overall Mac practices because of like time machine issues, like our IT department, it actually will reset every single day and it makes our Macs automatically turn off to be more stable. So uh, just be aware of that. Okay, so we see uh, from Michael Pierce, uh, is there any chance you could quickly demo the multi-channel warping in Cubase 12, perhaps for drum editing? Certainly, so let me just jump back to our previous project. Okay, so I'm going to place all of my drums, let's say into a folder. So I'll just select those and we could move the selected tracks to the new folder and you know we can enable group editing and also phase coherent audio warp. Okay, so let's come here and we have to 
bounce a file or two or musical mode. Okay, so now that we have this going on and we want to do warp editing. So now we, I could go to my free warp tab. So let's say, okay, I want this and I could put this on kind of right here. Chuck Ainley calling me. I'll just send him a message in a second. So now that we've done this, the warping has been applied to all the tracks that are in the folder. And at this point, we could just do kind of our warp editing like so. So, and if you already have the warp markers from hit points, um, at that point, you could, uh, those will automatically be populated. But as you add a warp, marker to one track you could see that it's going to automatically be added to every track so make sure they're in a folder that you have group editing and probably phase coherent warping and then you could move everything like so i'm gonna text chuck back give me just a moment with me just sorry All right, so let me know if that works for you, Michael. Yeah. All right. All right, and we have Luca checking in from Munich. Um, All right, uh, so I see, can you please explain how to sync live drums in a natural way? So if you mean kind of um, syncing them to like a project or if you're doing time compression, so let me just, um, so, but if you wanted to take a look, like let's say if we wanted to do like a tempo map of like a drum performance that's varying in tempo. So what I could do here is I'm gonna take like an overhead track. So if I wanted to sync, so I'm not sure if you want this, the drums to sync to the tempo, but or if you wanted to have the tempo sync to the drums. So I'll just do a quick tempo detection here. So now we've created a tempo map. So at this point, we can just say, so let's say if we have a pickup note. All right, so let's say we want this to be, um, So I'll just add a signature track. Sorry, it's probably hidden. And say this is where our 4-4 is at this point. So that's how we could find the tempo of the audio to sync. Now, if, if these are all doing different variations in time, what I could do is take these tracks and what I want to do now is go to audio and we could choose advanced and we'll say set definition from tempo. And now that those are done, I could just come here and say, okay, I wanted these to play back all 
And let's say if we look at our tempo map here, we can say, okay, when tempo is turned on, we're around 100 beats a minute, 98. So if I wanted those to play back perfectly at 120 beats per minute and to be perfectly steady or 100, I can now just kind of change the tempo uh, freely and it will, uh, the, the drums will automatically respond. So if I wanted to take this and do like an accelerando, so as we go, all the drums will kind of speed up together and all of our tracks could do it without changing the pitch and we're right back to the original tempo. So those are a couple ways of syncing drums, but if you wanted to sync drums some other way, just uh, let me know. But All right. All right, so we have Roland Klein checking in from uh, Kalmar, Sweden. And I saw Stefan, I think, from Sweden as well. Thanks for joining us. All right, we have Graham Witcher joining us from Wooten Bassett, Grand Wooten Bassett in the UK. All right, we see Bim. All right. All right, we have Camille checking in from the Czech Republic. Thanks for joining us. Chatfield just jumped on me, so. Okay, so we just see a uh, question. Uh, I have a bug. I can't select the part I recorded, MIDI and audio. I'm running Cubase 11 Artist on Windows 64X. Um, so, you know, make sure one, I mean, so if we just record an audio part here, so let's say I just recorded audio and I have this track armed for record. So now as we're recording, we could do this. So make sure that, um, you know, it could be maybe if you're, you know, there is a mode where we could have a combined selection and object tool. So it could be maybe if you're selecting it from the top that you're in the range tool mode, but in the bottom, it get, switches to the object selection. So as we move the tool, you can see that when it gets to the bottom half, that it changes, but you should be able to select, but in just in case you see like this little area here, orange, uh, illuminated orange, at this point we could select the event. So try selecting from the bottom and see if that makes a difference, but you should be able to obviously select the event. We see are you sad because you can't restart the program after every recording? So there right, you see Stella is healing fast, which is Mark Raven's dog, so that's great. Um, so we see from Sven Isaacson, uh, I'm considering buying an M1 Mac for the main purpose of remote recording, no heavy mixing or VSTIs. What do you think, a MacBook Air, a gigabyte, cut it with Cubase Pro, or should I go Pro? So I think if you're just capturing audio, um, and if it's like, you know, 24 tracks, I think you're fine with that configuration, uh, as long as, you know, your audio interface works with it. Um, so usually tracking doesn't take a lot of CPU resources and obviously the MacBook Air is very portable. So I think you should be fine. All right. All right, so if you see 
I think it's Mamin's topic. He's a fan of Cubase now, so it's great. We see Kerwin Young on from Atlanta. We see Tim Weinheimer from Mission Viejo. We hope you're safe from, I saw news of the fires not far from you, so I hope you're safe from that. All right, we see Sir Robert from Atlanta on as well. We see Sable Winters wishing a happy Friday the 13th. Didn't, know, didn't realize it was Friday the 13th. Okay, so we have um, greetings from question. How do I, greetings from Zambia. Uh, how do I set up my space bar to stop and start playback from the last position played? but also stops when it's already playing. Uh, it can only seem to, you know, see if there's any continuation. Okay, so, you know, so if we wanted to do like our space bar, so let's come over here, there's two different modes that you could work. So, you know, there's gonna be a start stop. So if I use my space bar here and let's say zoom in a bit, So now it will start stop exactly where I stopped it. And when I hit the space bar again, so with this, the space bar is kind of, you know, stop start. So we could have this automatically and the mode I'm in, when I stop, it will go. Now, if I wanted to jump back to where I started from, which is handy for like different types of editing, we could go over to the preferences and change the uh, under transport, we'll see uh, return to start position on stop. So check this preference out. So now when I hit stop, so let's say instead of stopping and, and kind of where it's at, it now just automatically goes right back to where I started playing back. So I have a keyboard shortcut set up where I could hit shift plus spacebar, and that will toggle that behavior. So now when I stop, it's gonna stop and continue from there. If I hit shift plus spacebar again, and this is a keyboard shortcut I set up for the preference, it'll now just kind of toggle that mode. Now, if you have a numeric keypad, since you know the spacebar is doing both playing and stopping, it can't really distinguish between the two stop modes. But if you have a numeric keypad, you could hit the uh, enter key on the numeric keypad for play. And then if you hit stop once, uh, depending on, let's say if I switch my preference again. So now I hit play and now I could hit stop, hit the zero key on the numeric keypad. It stops where it was, and then if I hit the zero key again, it goes back to that previous position. So maybe just go to that particular preference where you could just say transport, uh, and you could have return to start position on stop and toggle that, and I think that will help you. All right, so we see Uno Memento from Finland, 15 degrees Celsius and sunny. And he wants, to, he's giving two beers to everyone. It's good for a Friday afternoon. All right, we have Simon Wong checking in from Malaysia. All right, we have Soren from Sweden. All right. Sable Winters, of course, from Bay Area, San Francisco. All right, so we have Talamarud Bazad checking in from Iran. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we have Robert checking in from Sweden. Uh, if I'm still in my creative phase, is there a way to automatically sync uh, the score page to my chord track? So let's go ahead and take a look. So I'll just open up in our project here, which has some chord track data. All 
Okay, so let's say I just have a uh, just a quick MIDI part. I'll just create kind of a blank MIDI part between the left and right locators. So here we have a chord track going into my song. So let's say at this point, uh, when I go to this, I'm going to open the score editor and I'll just control or command and we'll zoom if we're in page mode. So really all you have to do is go to the scores menu and at this point, go to advanced layout and say show chord track. And now the chords would automatically be placed into uh, the, the chords in, in directly into the score automatically. So, so that's how you could sync. So once again, uh, go to the score menu, scores menu to advanced layout and show chord track. All right, so we see uh, Jesse Carmichael. So good to see you, Jesse. Um, hey, Greg and all. Uh, I saved two ruler formats in the bottom menu, uh, bars and beats, and one for time code for the other. Uh, but every time I open up the template, uh, they're, they're both time code thoughts. Let's see if I could recreate that. Okay, so I'll add some ruler tracks. Okay, make sure we have. Okay, so we have this and let me just save this as a template. Okay, I'm gonna go to new project. Let me close this one. And we'll go to new project here. So it seemed like that saved uh, on my end there, Jesse. So, but one thing to check is also, you know, you have a primary uh, and secondary time display. Um, so here I have mine kind of set for time code, but let's say if I have that set to bars and beats and this to time code, and let me see if you have it, your... Yeah, so you have it for beats and time code, and let's say if I just do a new project again, create. So those seem to kind of work uh, saving it, but if you want to email me a, a quick project, Jesse, just you know, just your template, I'd be happy to kind of take a look at it and see if it was uh, misbehaving on my end too. All right, we see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. He's uh, pouring concrete for his studio, so it's always nice to do a studio expansion. So we see Mark Rabin is having rain, sleet, hail, and snow flurries. Okay, you see Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button. All right, just looking back for a previous question here that may have been covered. Yeah, so I just see, um, and this is the person that couldn't select a file, just saying they're thinking of deleting Cubase after 10 years. Um, 
So, but if you, you know, let me know, you know, uh, what you're doing. And also one of the things that you could do, uh, if you're still having problems, if you want to like, you know, perhaps do a, uh, video showing kind of what's going on, uh, you could do it, uh, maybe record it on, uh, like even OBS or some like screen, uh, recording software. I'd be happy to take a look at it. You could email a link to the video to clubcubase at steinberg.de. All right, we have Michael Marshall checking in from Somerset, UK. Thanks for joining us, being a part of the community today. All right, we see Michael Teams has started dispensing virtual ice cream. All right, so we see, uh, hi, Greg. How do I set taps on the multi-tap in milliseconds? Exa example, set one tap to 60 milliseconds and left 90. Uh, Cubase, no, Cubase 11, so let's take a look. Okay, so let's say. You know, so as soon as we come here, so let's say if we just add multiple taps here, then at this point you could just freely move whatever tap that you want. And let's see if we could Get it to specific milliseconds. So let's see if maybe if we turn sync off. All right, so let's say if we want it to be uh, 30 milliseconds. So then I think if we do this, and we add taps. At that point, you could freely kind of move uh, the, the space between each tap right there. So, um, let me see if there's like an exact millisecond value for that, but you know, you should be able to kind of space it out just, just like that when the multi-tap delay, so. Right. So you see Michael Pierce is about the snapping transient. He's going to check it out. All right. So we see, uh, Greg, I have a question. I have all my Steinberg libraries on an external disk. Whenever I start Cubendo, without that disconnected, I have to confirm or locate all those missing samples. Uh, any way to disable that? So I think... If you have missing content that you should be able to just, you know, it should say, um, and I get the message because I have some demo licenses that expired and it says can't find these contents and just hit OK. Um, and then it kind of ignores all those for me. So, so if I was starting, let's see if I start Cubase 10.5, I may get kind of a, or if I start Cubase 11, I may get a similar message just to show you.
So I should get kind of my content messages here, libraries. So I have some content can't be loaded, so I hit OK. And then I think I have like one sound set. So like when I when I don't have those licenses, um, it you know I'll just kind of get that message and I hit OK for all. And if it's not ex seeing kind of where maybe it expects. Uh, the content, you may have to kind of do it one by one, but I think there might be a, you know, choose this option for all. Uh, but, and also if you have the option of, you know, just having your drive connected, that's always a good thing because, uh, you know, if you access sounds and try to do it in another file, you know, if, if you're saving projects, um, you know, where it doesn't have the content, you know, that could cause problems later. So. And also, this is for uh, Odivali, who is having problems with selecting files. Um, one thing to try also is to run the program with the preferences disabled. So as you start the program, hold down, if you're on Mac, Command, Option, plus Shift, and hold it down right after uh, you start the program. And if you're on Windows, Alt, Control, plus Shift, and then choose to start the program without uh, your preferences, so just temporarily disable the preferences and see if that uh, does the trick. All right, so we see uh, from Music TM, and I guess this might have been with the drum question, but uh, like with how to get the drums, and you know, we can say how to get the drums to sync to MIDI files. So, you know, if it's a multi track drums, you could do just exactly what we did. If it's going to be a, you know, like a drum loop. You know, or like, a, you know, you could also just kind of take, you know, different drum loops. And if we place these into musical mode directly from uh, the, the project window, so if we select it, place it into musical mode, then the drum loop, if it knows what the tempo is of the original file, which most drum loops will automatically do, will have that information embedded as metadata into the file then it will automatically follow the tempo changes once it's placed into musical mode. So we see right now, if I take it out of musical mode, it's not going to uh, automatically follow and sync up, but once it's set to musical mode, then that will automatically sync with a particular uh, MIDI file. So. All right, so we see Nick on the live stream. All right, my chat field jumped on me. trying to find my spot sorry about that okay so all right so i think i'm back all right uh so we have a question can you show how to add change or delete notes in the score editor please okay so let me just add an instrument track Okay, so let's say I have just a blank part. Let's go to our score editor. So we could say I want to choose different rhythmic values. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this and put our score into page mode. And this is what it'll look like 
on a printed page. I could hold down the control or command key and just kind of zoom in. And at this point, if we wanted to uh, just say, okay, I want this on beat one, let's put this on beat three, I could kind of see this grid overlay. As we go to add notes, and let's say I wanted to switch to eighth notes, so I could just And then to a half note. So now we could just kind of edit our scores uh, accordingly. If I wanted to erase, you know, to move the pitch of notes, I could select the pitch and just move them up just directly like that. And if I wanted to erase notes, I could grab right click and grab the eraser tool and just erase notes. So we could do that, but or if you record directly into the score editor, you could just hit record and all the notes will show up directly there. All right, so I just see what's that square under the mute button. So I'm not sure if it's in here. Uh, so if it's this square that you're talking about um, on the tracks, uh, this would allow you to put like track pictures into the actual events and that's what that is for. So if it looks a little blank, you could say, okay, this is my drum kit and you could just select different images uh, for different tracks so you could see them and you could even put user images in. So if you say, okay, want this to be a bass, like a Fender P bass kind of vibe. We could just have uh, actual user pictures right there. Okay, um, so we see a question from Jan from QBaseIndex.com. Um, it says, you show answer to easiest way to import pattern from Groove. There I notice you, that patterns icon light up and which and show which pattern is being played. That's not the case with me. Um, so I'm not sure if this is with Groove Agent. Um, Okay, so let's, I think it's from with Groove Agent. So let me just check. Okay, so I will. Okay, so it says, uh, then I noticed the pattern icons light up and show which pattern is being played. So I'll, I'll go ahead and just come here and let's all right so as i play here so i'm just gonna so we can see this outline that this is the default pattern and when i click on a pattern we can see that it gets kind of highlighted here to indicate which one is selected so we get kind of the outline um and I see that just Jan saying it's not the case with him. So, you know, it could be maybe, you know, if you have the full version of Groove Agent SE, you could have 128 pattern banks. Uh, whereas the Groove Agent SE um, has 16. But if, let me know if this is what you're kind of talking about, Jan, these patterns being highlighted. But you may have, like, when we go to instruments, we could have different banks. And if you have the full version of Groove Agent, when you go to the patterns, you'll also have different banks. So make sure that you have uh, the correct bank selected if you're in the full version of Groove Agent, uh, because there could be eight banks of 16 different pads that could each be triggered by a particular MIDI note, an independent MIDI note. And if you have the wrong bank selected, you might not see it.
All right, so we have a question from Dallas LaRue. Uh, this question is, I can't find the select all, control A, and the octave up or down, shift arrow up or down in the command preferences. I'm trying to make a macro to combine those two commands. Um, so it may not be, because depending on where you're at and what function, so let's say if we have you know, MIDI notes, going on here, you know, a great keyboard shortcut that a lot of people don't know is to just take this and if you hold down shift plus, uh, you know, the up or down arrow that you could, you know, here I can move it diatonically or, or chromatically. And if I hold down shift, I can move it an octave at a time. Uh, so, you know, but those functions could have, a, you know, there's multiple things that you do shift up arrow, down arrow, depending on what is selected. So if you wanted it to be, um, I'll just, so you're trying to, if you're trying to make a command, like a macro for this, you could do it in the logical editor. So let's say if I just wanted to come here to the logical editor and this could be just um, called up as well. So let's say I wanted to transform, uh, we'll say uh, type is equal to note and we'll say value one, the pitch, we'll say add and then I'll do 12. So now I could just come here and now every time that we do this, um, we could knock it up an octave or we could subtract an octave as well. So as soon as I come here, let's select all the notes. So now if we just come here, we could, or choose to add an octave. So if you want it, and then you could save these uh, as uh, keyboard shortcuts that, so if you save a preset, um, so let's just say, we'll call it Dallas LaRue. And so, Let's say we go to our save changes as preset. So we'll just call it Dallas Rue plus 12. So now as soon as you do that, if you wanted to incorporate that into a macro, we would come over here to edit to key commands and then at that point, um, we'll see logical process, logical editor, process, logical preset. And then we'll just see Dallas LaRue plus 12. And you could incorporate that into a macro. But again, when you hit like shift plus up or down, it's more kind of context sensitive based on what the active window and what the particular function is because that that key command can do multiple things depending on what's active. So that's why sometimes some of those may not be, you know, like hitting tab key may not be accessible from uh, for using macros and stuff like that. So let me know if that works. All right, so we have a question from uh, KG Holly. Uh, I select a track and record is automatically enabled. How can I disable that? I know there's a setting somewhere, but I can't remember where. So if we come here, we could have, there's a preference. So let's go over to preferences. And I think it's under editing project and uh, maybe under project and mix console. Uh, and that will be enable record on selected audio track. So if we turn off, if we turn that on and I hit apply, that now I could, as soon as I select the track, it's record enabled. And if I don't want that enabled, I come over here to the preferences and I'll disable that, hit apply, hit okay. So now when I select a track and 
that's a MIDI track, but let's just come to an audio track and we could separate that from MIDI and audio. So now as soon as we do that, it's not automatically done. So once again, come to preferences, pro, uh, editing project and mix console, and you could, you could uncheck una enable record on selected audio track. All right, so we have uh, Ehab Muhammad checking in. So thanks for joining us. All right, so we just see a question uh, from Got Your. Uh, anybody else uh, crashing when you open up a big project? My Cubase works fine and no problem except. Uh, after I save and close a project, it will not recover to open another one. I have to control alt delete. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this has happened after the latest update. So sometimes that's often just a plugin that's not, you know, some plugins just don't release memory. Some samplers, popular samplers that people use can be guilty of it. Um, and it just won't release that memory. So. Uh, so we see what's different between this version and 10. So, you know, version 11 added, uh, I think the multi-tap delay, it added like the scale assistant. It added also the, um, the squasher plugin. It added some more video capabilities. It added also um, the uh, batch export cues. Um, some additional notation functionality. Um, so, you know, in different scale assistance in the MIDI editor uh, and improved pitch bend editing, Cubase 12 uh, added like the ability of making chord tracks from deriving it from an audio file. It's going to add also the FX modulator plugin. It's going to be M1 native compatible on the Mac platform. There's a change in the licensing, so you no longer need the, the uh, e-licensor. Uh, so it's now an identity management system. So, you know, there's probably about two or 300 features that have been added from 10 to 12. So... All right, so we see Tim Weinheimer is safe from the Orange County, California fires. So I guess they're down near Laguna Beach. It's a beautiful area. All right, so we have Cap Energy Music checking in from near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. All right, we have Hamad checking in from Kuwait. All right, we have Alex from Missouri in the US. All right, Alex is asking, uh, is it worth updating to this one from Cubase 10? So, you know, there's probably about, from Cubase 10, you know, you had 10.5, 11 to 12. So it's probably about 300, 400 new features, plus a lot of great workflow enhancements. So yeah, definitely worth it. All right, so we have Sesame Inc. checking in from Central Florida. Thanks for joining. All right, uh, so we have a question from Luis Che. Uh, I heard you many times talking about musical mode. Can you explain what that is and give us some examples? Okay, so let's say I have this particular drum loop. Um, Okay, so when we look at this drum loop, uh, we drop it into a project. Uh, 
we could see that the name of the drum loop says 125 BPM in the name. So my project, let's say, is at 100 beats a minute. So now I put my metronome on and we listen. The audio isn't really lining up with the particular metronome. So if I wanted that audio file to line up musically, since that information is in the name and, and often within metadata, if I wanted this file to automatically match the tempo, at this point we could put it into musical mode. So now as I play, I'll just pick, see if I can pick a worse audio file here. Okay, so let's say I'll just do this one. Okay, so I'm gonna just snap. Okay, so now we have, let's say this not in musical mode. Okay, so I listen to it now, and so, but as soon as I enable musical mode, then it's gonna automatically fit the timing. Now, if I have a number of tempo track changes, I can come here, let's go to uh, our tempo. And let's say I just wanted to have different tempo changes. Instead of this audio file playing back one steady tempo, if it's in musical mode here, I'll just take this and now it's gonna speed up and slow down to match the tempo. So musical mode will make it follow like the timing of the actual audio files. So when you come here, you just say, okay. So the audio files follow the tempo. When it's not in musical mode, they're gonna play back the, the same speed as the audio. So musical mode enables it to follow whatever tempo changes you have for audio events. All right, so we see Jay from Connecticut on the live stream. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we have Steven checking in from Sacramento, California. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we have a question. Uh, testing some sampling and I want my load on the system to be super duper low. Would loading an instance of Cubase LE versus Cubase Pro lower the demand on my system resources for one track? Um, so I think if you're not really doing any, you know, I think if you're running the same project in either one, if you're just running one track that you're not going to really uh, notice a huge difference. You know, if, you know, obviously with the additional functionality and plugins in Cubase, uh, that could add more CPU resources. But if you're just doing kind of the same exact work, I think it would be pretty identical. Um, I could do a, a test over the weekend if you want to email me, but I think that you would, wouldn't have any issues running on Cubase Pro. All right, so we see it from Oida Valley, um, you know, and again, if you just says, uh, 
that the live streams are his chance for him and got yours. So, yeah, you know, if you want to do a quick video and share that, I'd be happy to take a look at it as well. So and if you want to do just like a full screen video, that's always helpful instead of sometimes people do like show just part of a screen on a phone capture and it's, you know, doesn't show all the information. But if you do that and email link to uh, club cubase at steinberg.de. All right, so we see, uh, hi Greg, a uh, new Cubase user here. Can you tell me how to export an Atmos mix as a stereo down mix? Generally, when you're doing an Atmos mix, you know, one of the things when you do the uh, export ADM file, so let's say if we are here and we go to uh, the project, you know, with the, one of the big concepts when you uh, are working in Atmos is with the ADM information that it should, if you're doing a uh you know if you're doing your atmos mix that it will automatically fold down to whatever playback system that you're working in so if it's playing back in a mono file it will fold down automatically to mono stereo 5.1 or full atmos rig or if you're doing a theater with 64 speakers in it that the atmos is scaling and doing all the uh all the playback changes automatically depending on the playback system. And that's kind of the intention of working with Atmos. So, so if you're, you want to deliver your Atmos as a stereo down mix, you know, you can just simply, you know, if you're doing it as your Atmos mix at that point, um, it should automatically down mix to stereo when it's playing back in stereo. Just reading through comments. So thanks for all the great questions. If you learned something new, make sure you do hit the like button. All right, so we see, uh, hello, how would you configure Cubase uh, if you have 32 microphones in the studio? I want to use RME UFX and make a live recording, thanks. All right, so depending on however many inputs that your audio interface has, uh, Cubase can handle, I think, up to 256 live inputs, which should be enough. Uh, but when you go to, let's say if we're doing kind of a new project, I could come directly here. So I'd say, okay, we'll do new blank project, we'll create empty. And at this point, we will say, okay, I'm going to add. So go to your audio connections here. You'll see inputs. Um, and there will be presets. So like I have a two in uh, audio interface. But if you have like, if your audio interface has 32 inputs, at this point, all you'd have to do is say add bus and say, okay, I want this to be 32 mono inputs. And as you would do this, uh, this would automatically increment your audio interface for, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you wanted to rename these, you could just hit the tab key to go to the next name if you wanted to. And as we come over here, we can say, let's add 32 audio tracks. So, and let's say if we wanted these all to be uh, set to different inputs at this point, I could just come here and hold down the shift key and say, okay, I want this as input one. I have all the channels selected and now all of my inputs will be rippled. So we'll see, okay. Um, that you could just simply have all of your inputs and just hit record. So if your RME UFX, you know, has 32 ins, you could, you know, just configure the inputs on the channels and then just hit record on all the tracks. And if you want to take all 32 tracks 
and make it simpler for recording. Come here, select the top track, hold down the shift key, select the bottom track, uh, select right click and say move selected tracks to new folder. And then you could record enable all and monitor all of the tracks just by clicking on the folder track right there. So. All right, we have Matt Elston checking in from London. Thanks for joining us. Glad you can make it tonight. All right, uh, so we have a question from Jay. It says, uh, I'm only raising this as I, and it's a possibility that it's only me. I'm looking for, at the transverse, transverse instrument on sale, and it is very vague on requirements. Seems VST is no longer clear about e-license or USB dongle requirements, if activated without or not. They all seem to imply online licensing, but it contradicts what you and others have stated. So. Most of the VST instruments, just about all of our VST instruments can utilize the soft e-licensor. So it's still on the e-licensor, but you do not require the USB e-licensor. So that was only for, uh, I think, WaveLab Pro, Cubase Artist, Cubase Pro, and Nuendo. Uh, I think everything else runs off of the soft e-licensor. So it's not on the new licensing system, but it is. It, you can use it without the without utilizing um, the USB e licensor. So when they say it's like an online activation, so it could do that or you could place it on a USB e licensor, uh, but it doesn't require a USB e licensor because it is a soft e license. All right, so we see from Jesse Carmichael that I broke his spell. It says, this time when I saved a template and reopened it, all the bars and beats and time code allowed uh, showed up at the bottom. Cheers. So, yeah, it was just my karmic presence over the internet to you, Jesse, because you're such a good guy. So glad it's working for you, and thanks for joining us on the live stream. All right, so Michael Pierce's soup contribution for everyone today is... French lentils with mushrooms and kale, big enough for two pots. All right. And Nick wants to sign up for the soup, so that sounds good. Got to give soup tips on the next Zoom meetup. All right, so we have Brian Sawyer from Beulahville, North Carolina. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so we have a question. Uh, hello, is there a tool in Cubase to remove background noise and guitar recordings like spectral subtraction? Um, so if you do have kind of, uh, you know, a noisy audio file, you know, one of the tools, and I'll just add a quick audio file in that you could use is going to be, uh, you'll have spectral layers one, which is part of the Cubase, I think, artist and pro license. And at this point, um, as soon as we, let me just select the track and we could just add it as an ARA2 extension. So as soon as I want it to come over here, we could do kind of spectral editing directly inside. So if we wanted to kind of look at, you know, a noisy guitar part, you could just come over here and, you know, take out particular frequencies. There's more advanced versions of spectral layers where you could take like a noise imprint and be able to, you know, take, you know, register the noise and then be able to take the noise imprint and be able to remove and filter out those particular frequencies. But check out the spectral layers one. 
uh, and a, that will allow you to do spectral editing. And that's a part of Cubase Artist or Cubase uh, and Cubase Pro, I believe. So I know it's in Cubase Pro. Okay, um, so we see I've been trying to figure this out for like 30 minutes. I want to control expression in a controller lane with a slider on my MIDI keyboard. How do you set this up? Okay, so let's say um, I'm just gonna use a controller here. So you have to figure out what MIDI message your slider is transmitting to start with. So let's say if I have a MIDI part or an instrument track here, just load up a retro log quickly. Okay, so let's say, let me find something where the mod wheels like really. Or the, I'll just load up an orchestral thing here quickly. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's say All right, so at this point, let's say if I come over here, uh, I wanted my expression controller to be, let's say I wanted this to be expression. So I need expression to kind of change the dynamics of this. So what you want to do is to figure out what MIDI controller, you know, because if it's not, if your MIDI controller isn't spitting out CC11, then we can change it in Cubase. But you have to know what MIDI message your controller is transmitting. So let's come over here and if we could do this by going to the MIDI inserts and let's go to MIDI monitor. So let's say I want it to come here and I'm gonna turn on my MIDI monitor and let's just bring it to the front here. So now when I move my fader, I can see that this is controller one. This is my modulation wheel. But here I need to record the controller 11. So. What I could do is on this particular track, we have a function called the input transformer. In previous versions to 12, it was this little icon right here. And now we could go to our input transformer and we could say, let's put it on the track. And then when we go to our input transformer, let's just close these windows here. We're going to just open up the panel. So what we want to do is basically take, our fader is transmitting controller one and I want to take controller one and turn it into controller 11. So I'm gonna come here and say, we're gonna take uh, type is equal. We'll first activate the module and we'll say type is equal to controller. And then in we want to choose transform here. And then we'll say, we're going to take value one and then we're gonna add 10 to it. So now when I go to my MIDI, I move this. Now my knob went from channel one and it added 10. So that's now transmitting MIDI controller 11. So you have to figure out what message and you can often set what message is actually being transmitted in the controller. So if you, but sometimes they're fixed. So now when I do this, when I move my modulation wheel, it's actually transmitting not MIDI CC1, but MIDI CC11, which is what this instrument is responding to. So figure out what controller it is, and you can do that utilizing the uh, MIDI monitor plugin. And then from there, if you need to, go to the input transformer. 
and then you could set that at track level or the project level. And there's probably even a preset for, uh, you know, take um, MIDI CC1 to CC11. It's a pretty typical thing. But you, but you could just simply come right there and even just save that as a preset. So do those things. And, you know, and if your controller is spitting out 63 and you need it to... Uh, you know, transmit 11, you would just choose not to add 10, but to subtract 52. Right, my chat field just jumped on me. Just find where I was. See, I have lots of questions in my future. Okay, so I think I'm. All right, so we have a question from Brian Sawyer. Um, have a WAV file that is set for 110 BPM. Uh, when Cubase is set for 110 BPM, 110 BPM, uh, the two do not line up. Uh, is there a way to grid match the wave? Um, so one thing is, you know, make sure that a that they're set to the right uh, sample rate. Um, but and if you have like an audio file, you know, really all you have to do is grab the time warp tool so if, and we put this into warp grid and we can say this is where and what we could do now uh, i'm going to take this and put it not into musical mode and i can say so we go to our warp tool and i just say oh this is where measure two starts and this is where measure three starts and this is where measure four starts this is where measure five starts or measure six starts. And you could just move the measures manually to match. So let me know if that'll work for you, Brian. Okay. Okay, so we see a question. Uh, how can I record my screen with sound on Cubase? I have a UA Apollo Solo Windows 11. Um, so if you wanted to record your screen, uh, you know, Cubase doesn't capture video, so you could use some utility uh, for doing that. So if you're on Windows 11, you know, OBS is a free solution that will work. Uh, and as, as far as recording with sound, it could really be, um, you know, you could, there's a number of different workarounds. Like for my live streams, what I do is I take my audio interface into a Yamaha mixer and that Yamaha mixer is what gets transmitted for the live stream. Uh, many audio interfaces like the Steinberg UR series have a loop back function. So you could use a loop back function and you could turn that on in the control panel of the audio interface. So if your Apollo solo has a loopback function, that should then allow you to capture that audio. So, but there's a chance that your Apollo may not have a loopback function. Then you may have to come up with another tricky solution. But mo a lot of audio interfaces will have loopback. Um, and I'll show you on the uh, DSP mix effects here on the Steinberg interface. So as soon as I want to come here, So let's say for my DSP mix effects, so in your Apollo may have something similar. I don't have one. Um, but all you need to do is just kind of, okay, I won't 
do, I won't update the firmware in the middle of a live stream, but you could just kind of turn the loop back on uh, directly here. So you, you could just say live cast and that would capture it, or you could do voice chat and that would uh, allow you, if you have other people that you're chatting with, so you're not recording yourself twice, creating kind of a feedback loop. So check that out, see if your interface has a loopback function. All right, uh, so we see a question. Hi, I'm new to DAW slash Cubase. Is it uh, possible to share smartphone version Cubase audio file to my laptop version of Cubase using Ableton Link? Uh, also, is it possible to merge? So um, no, you don't need Ableton Link for that. Really, all you need to do is you could download a Cubasis project importer, and then all you have to do is just literally come here and import Cubasis project. So that way, if you just put it on like a Dropbox or a Google Drive or, you know, uh, various like cloud-based systems, you could then just import, download the file to your computer and import it directly into Cubase from Cubasis. So. All right, so as you see, uh, Robert just mentioning about the missing content, says the pop-up show comes up when you have missing license, uh, when you have a valid license but no samples, it'll complain for each one. So um, I'll see if I, I'll mention to the development team to see if it could be a ignore all uh, message that pops up. So sorry about that. All right, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to switch between multi-compressor on my main bus, like a AB? Um, so let's say if we have, you could probably save maybe a, a snapshot. So let's come here. Just All right, so let's say we have this project and let's say we have multi-band compressor. All right, so let's say we come here. All right, so if it's within the same plugin, Alright, so let's say if I have this at all right, so I think there's like an A B function. Let me just see if I could if it's within the plugin itself. Let me just Okay, so if we come here, we could say uh, apply current settings uh, A to B. Okay, and let's say if I wanted to go to Dance Master. So if I wanted to come here, then you could just switch between. So check to see uh, if you're using the multiband compressor, let me know if that would work. So you could just kind of save the settings and toggle back and forth between two settings on the multiband compressor. So let me know if that works for you.
reading through comments. Okay, still reading through comments. That's great comments reading through. And just kind of seeing more discussion on the using the Apollo for capturing. So yeah, I mean, see if if the Apollo has the loop back. So All right, so we see, I just see a question. Uh, how did you enter several MIDI events fast just now? So it's probably 20 minutes ago, but it may have been using the uh, paintbrush tool. So, you know, if you wanted to come here, let's say if I have a MIDI part, you know, so I just have like the drawing tool or the, I have it set to the paint tool here. So I could just kind of draw in notes. Uh, if I wanted to hold down like control, I could, that would restrict it. So it's only gonna enter the notes on one single pitch if you wanted to do that. So you could also kind of just draw notes in with the pencil tool. Uh, but if you wanted to do it, you know, super fast, like, you know, we had someone last week that asked, you know, how to do 16th notes um, on like a hi-hat. So you just grab this tool here at the very end, the paintbrush tool and hold down control or command. You can now just kind of paint in notes very quickly that way. So let me know if that's how, what you're meaning. This is from Thomas Freude B. Kin. I'm sure I mispronounced that. My apologies. All right, so I have a question. Uh, if I use a drum loop from Media Bay, can I get the ride, hi-hat, et cetera, on separate channels from the loop? Um, the one time you could do it is if they're not playing on top of other things, but if you have like the hi-hat going the same time as a kick or snare, you can't really separate those very effectively. I mean, there's some tools, you know, you could filter out frequencies and stuff like that, but um, it's not gonna automatically be broken down apart from like a, a typical stereo drum loop. Okay.
Okay, so we see from Mike Rivera, uh, is there a way to flip MIDI example recording MIDI from bars two to eight and I want to flip it to plays from bar eight to two without bouncing to audio? Um, so if we have MIDI data, so, all right, so let's say if I go from Just switches to bars and beats. Okay, so let's say I have this going from two to eight. Um, so if I wanted to select all of the events here, um, we could go to MIDI and under functions, if you wanted to reverse the MIDI. So if you wanted to flip it, like that. So let me know if that would do what you wanted to do, Mike, if you wanted to reverse it. So. All right, so we see, um, hello, Greg, a question. In uh, Cubase 12, I don't have any Steinberg loops. How do I fix that? So it could really depend on what you downloaded initially. So when you come to the Steinberg Download Assistant, um, you know, the loops, you know, one of the things that people had complained about in previous versions was the fact that they had to download kind of every single thing in one huge file. And if they had kind of a slow internet connection, that it was problematic for them. So let me just cancel out of this quickly. Okay, so when you go to your Cubase here, um, and you'll see in the Steinberg download, download assistant, go to your Cubase Pro, and then at this point, uh, so many people will just install the application, um, but there's all sorts of different content. So if you haven't gone through and installed all of the different drum loops and content and samples, you know, you please do because it's definitely worth uh, all of the content is there and you don't have to do it all at once. You could just install them two or three at a time if you needed to, or just, you know, click install all and that will install kind of all the content. So once you have those installed, they should automatically show up in your media and you'll see loops and samples and all those content libraries will just show up directly there. All right, so just seeing a comment, um, so about not being able to select events. Um, so the only workaround, workaround I found is gluing some other MIDI slash audio part onto it, then it becomes selectable. So let me just try something here. So I'm not sure if it's, you know, let me just try this. We'll just say um, events to part. Yeah, it's still selectable if it's a part or um, an event. Yeah, well, I'll look forward to just getting your video. All right, so we see from Jan that the uh, about the groove agent pattern playing wrong was in the full groove agent. So let me just open up the big one here. 
sometimes takes a little bit to load up. Um, so I'm just going to reread the comment. So Uh, so it said, uh, Greg, it is a full Groove Agent file I was referring to and had the imported pattern playing in the track, not the play button on Groove Agent as he did. Wrong icons, light, but the yellow, thanks. Okay, so let's say if I wanted to, let's load up uh, something fun, I'll do. Marco Miniman. So this may have more patterns in it. And that doesn't look like it does. So, but let's say, so let's say if I wanted to copy this pad, So maybe if you have kind of like a pad like this, that you see the pattern playing, but it's this one that's playing. So this is what could happen. Okay, so it says, um, all right, I'm just gonna reread this. It says, I was referring to when an imported pattern is played on the track, not the play button, as you did wrong icons, light, but not the yellow. Thanks, so. let's say if I drag this out. Okay, so once this pattern is playing, you know, then it's, this is kind of decoupled so let's say I, I choose to not have this follow the transport because it's not playing the pattern from the sequencer in Groove Agent. So, because all the MIDI data is just directly on the project. So at this point, you may not see the pad light up because it's not actually playing, but if you have this playing it may play the pad internally as well if you have it set to follow transport so but if the content is actually um so say now if we follow transport you may have kind of two patterns playing at the same time But if you have the data in the project window, you'd probably not want to have this pattern playing because it could be playing the same pattern twice and some notes may kind of um, cancel out. All right, uh, so I just see from Nick, uh, my media bay decided to lose all my loops and samples, uh, even the default Groove Agent sounds. I deleted the media defaults and .xml and just sorted it. Is there another way to sort this out without losing my hidden folders? So many times what you could do is actually just come uh, directly to the media bay. And at this point we could say, okay, when we go to the full media bay, you'll see like just the uh, VST sound. So try, you know, opening this up and just trying to, you know, rescan disk. So you could just simply kind of come over here and choose to rescan those and that will could probably wake up the actual uh, associations to the content as well.
Um, all right, so you see I'm having issues with Revoice Pro 4 crashing when using as ARA, ARA extension. I also had Eventide T-Verb cause Cubase to crash, which are both purchased. Uh, any suggestions how to fix this? So a lot of times, you know, ARA, you know, both, you know, ARA is kind of, you know, a constantly evolving uh, thing. So make sure that you have the latest versions. Uh, I think I have the Eventide T-Verb. I could check it on my studio PC um, and see if that is causing any problems. But if you could let us know if you're you know, running Mac, if you're running Windows, if you're running M1, if it's a VST2 version for the plugins or VST3, that information would be helpful. But you know, always make sure you're running kind of the latest um the latest versions as well. Let's see, uh, Michael Teams just uh, asking about a hot mess project says, hope you liked Magini's mirror, uh, it was different. So yeah, I got the file um, sent over to Gareth, I think Sunday night, maybe Monday. So I listened to it today and I didn't hate my bass part. So uh, anxious for you guys to hear it with the bass line. So we had some nice fretless parts in there. Yeah, and it was a lot of fun to play on, so. All right, so Mark Rabin says, hey, got a new second, and hit the like button. Okay. Okay, so we see Jazz Dude's not having any problems with his T-verb as well. Okay, so Michael Teams just saying like, 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 whack, 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 so. I guess he wants everyone to whack the like button. Okay, so I have a question. Uh, hi, Greg. Is it possible to create more clear contrast view in the editor with notes or audio with no dark notes or audio? So, you know, sometimes what you could do is, you know, you could, like, as we go into... Uh, sampler, depending on what parts you have, but sometimes like some of the MIDI stuff could be uh, faint. Um, and what some people do is just going into the preference uh, and you go into a user interface, uh, into color schemes. And at this point you could say, okay, I want the editor area background and maybe we want this to be lighter. So now when we go to a MIDI editor, if you wanted to kind of brighten it up to make the contrast, you could do that. Some people, um, I think Hans Zimmer, for instance, kind of just makes all of his notes white with the dark background. Last time I, was, I haven't been in his room in a while since COVID. Uh, but if we see if I could create that quickly, but let's come here and we'll apply the defaults. So I think that often he will choose to colorize his notes. Um, just move this up a little bit. So I think often he may come over here and just kind of colorize his notes to be white. So if he kind of makes, you know, so you could do some other stuff, but if you wanted to change kind of the background color, I, I know sometimes it could be a, a little dark and sometimes hard to contrast between the content and the background. So. All right, uh, so we have a question. Uh, is it possible to record automation on multiple tracks at once? I'd like to set the faders at Unity at some point in a session and write automation at that point without having to manually move 
to manually with the mouse. Um, so obviously that's why people would use, you know, control surfaces um, to, you know, to write multiple automation tracks at once. But um, we'll show you just a, a trick, you know, so if you don't want to do with mouse and if you want to control multiple parameters, we could come directly to, we'll show you this. If you wanted to hold down alt or option plus shift. So let's say I wanted to take all these tracks um, and while we're playing, I wanted to automate them. So we could activate quick link and then let's say as we automate, I can move one and then all the tracks will write automation. So whatever track is selected. So if I wanted to quick link the guitars, I could select these two. And then if I wanted to move the guitars together, we could choose to just automate both of those tracks at once using one mouse. But if you wanted to, you know, so, but if, but if you wanted to write independent values, then you, you know, you would need to have like a control surface or like a little fader box of some kind that you could have set up. All right, we see there's people want to start a petition for me to, to buy me a mic preamp. So I'll take a mic preamp, sure, why not? All right, so we see um, from John Daniels, it just says, uh, no special preset, I was moving one of the microphones and it immediately crashed, Cubase 12, Mac OS X, Catalina. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if, if it's gone, if Cubase 12 has gone through all the, you know, quality assurance stuff in Catalina. Most people are running it without issue. But... All right, so we see Neil Conway just giving special props to Jazz Dude for posting all the information he does. It's greatly appreciated. And this is, he says it's one of the most giving communities he's ever been a part of. And thanks to Jan, too. So, yeah, I totally occur, agree with that. So, and I think so many people give wonderful information and make it a great place to be. I appreciate everyone's contributions. All right, so we see KG Holly just says, I wish YouTube live let people reply more easily without using the at, at symbol. Very frustrating. Greg, can you fix that too? Maybe Cubase 13 and YouTube too. So when, once we get that combination, we should be all set. All right, so we see from uh, Luis uh, Che just says, I'm about to get a new Mac M1. How do I move my soft E licenses to the new computer? Can I just drag them to the Steinberg USB and move them that way? So once they're on the actual USB, at that point, you can't turn them into soft licenses after that. So just be aware of that. But uh, there is a procedure for reactivating soft e licenses in case you, you know, are migrating to a new computer, so you could look at into that. Um, but if you put it onto your USB e licensor, which is isn't a bad solution, then you know, realize that if you transfer it via a USB e licensor, it can't be converted back to a soft e license after that. So just just be aware. All right, we see Jazz Dude is posting a link for Nuendo 12 uh, Pro uh, trial version. So that's available now. And also for people, there's also, uh, if you're not familiar with it, we uh, are currently doing a Nuendo and Cubase cross grade promotion because some companies want everyone to move to a subscription model, even if their customers don't want to. So we've had a lot of people switching. Okay. Right, 
We see some moderation from Agent K and Jazz Dude. Thank you. Those guys are good. All right. Excuse me. Just find my spot. Okay, so we have a question from Sebastian. Um, I'd like to map the control room level to a MIDI controller or key command. Can I do that? So yeah, um, so if we wanted to just come over here, we could say, okay, we have our control room volume. So let's say, okay, we're gonna come right here. And if I wanted to map that to a MIDI, so let's say I will use my, I'll go to studio setup. So in previous versions, we could go to, uh, the MIDI port, uh, go to the generic remote. So you may have to click here to add a generic remote in the plus sign. So, and if I wanted to take a particular fader, so let's say, okay, I want to take it from um, my nectar. All right, and I'm going to learn. So let's say, okay, I'm just going to change my address here, make sure it's. All right, so I just click here, learn on the MIDI controller, and then we're gonna say control room, and we will say, okay, so let's go to command, control room. And I think there's a level or volume. Okay, so maybe under, it says go here. Um, Okay, so VST control room, All right, then device, and now we could come over here. Okay, so go to VST control room, to control room, to volume, and hit apply. So now as I move my modulation wheel, it's automatically controlling that. So you could do that. Now if you have the new MIDI remote system, so I'll just disconnect this. Um, we could go to any, so we go to our MIDI remote and I can say, okay, I want a slider here. So say I want to take this slider. Um, and then if we're in like the mapping assistant, so we could now just kind of double click. Let's say, okay, now we're here. Um, so I want this particular slider. Again, so I'll just move it once we've added it in the MIDI remote. And I could right click here and say pick up for MIDI remote, then click on apply mapping. And now this uh, particular fader is controlling the control room volume. So that's how you could do it with a new MIDI remote tab as well. So two different ways. So if you have Cubase 12, it's obviously a little easier. Okay, so we see Michael Pierce is off doing his tutoring. All right, so we see uh, now I have a signal, there is something, but still no audio. If I open up Cubase with YouTube, the audio is failing there as well. So realize that Cubase is gonna kind of use a different audio driver uh, mechanism. 
So one of the things that you want to do is uh, this from Anne Marie is just come over here and select the audio system and then click on release uh, driver when application is in background. But you know, make sure and you may have to dig into depending on the audio driver. Sometimes you may have to actually go. I had one laptop where I had to kind of dig into like, you know, sub menus or some menus in the least obvious place and tell it to share the audio driver between different applications. So, but definitely try going to your studio uh, setup. And then at that point, release, uh, select the audio system, click on release driver when application is in background. Another utility that people use is kind of a driver called ASIO for all, the number four. So A-S-I-O number four, all, ASIO for all. And you can download that and select that as your ASIO driver. And that may be a little more straightforward for you, Ann. Okay. Okay, so I see. Okay, I'll check my email, Jean Marie. I see he has to go to a session. So, all right. So we see Traka. Traka uh, is finally able to catch one of these live. Uh, says, "Can you make a question? Just ask. Uh, just ask your question. Type it in." So glad you can make a live one. All right, so we have a question from uh, Best Korean Jesus. Uh, so glad you can make the live stream today. He's based in San Diego. Uh, what is the best way to combine two MIDI events into one? I've been copying the data over because when I merge, weird things happen. Um, so, you know, if we wanted to, let me just go to a particular different project. Okay, think of the one. Okay, let's jump here. All right, so let's say we want to. duplicate this particular track here. All right, so you know if we have two events that are on top of each other, we'll see that it'll kind of change to be diagonal. Um, so when we have two events and if we wanted to merge them, uh, we can hold down, I think it's Alt or Option and with the glue gun and that will merge the events. Now, as we do that, realize that, you know, when something weird may happen is if you have a MIDI note on message that's conflicting with the same pitch as a MIDI off, note off message. So if you're combining two different parts that are may have the same pitch going on and off at the same time, you may run into problems with that if it's going to the same MIDI channel because the note can either be on or off. But that's probably the best way to combine the two MIDI events. Um, so, uh, but you know, and if you needed to put them onto different MIDI channels, you could do that if you have like the same pitch uh, conflicting with, you know, but on the two different parts. Yeah, so you see uh, John Daniel saying his main problem is the Revoice Pro 4. So I don't have a license of that, um, but I could do some more research if you wanted to email me. All 
All right, so we see a uh, question, Greg. What interface do you have? Uh, I'm using a UR24C uh, for the live streams. I have, when I travel, when I used to travel, it was a UR22, uh, which was updated to UR22C. And for my personal studio, I have an AXR4U, which is the USB version. That's why I use in my personal studio. All right, so I just see a question from Roger uh, Cabo. Uh, would it be possible to clear up all audio files automatically and let save the song into another folder containing all audio files and settings in one step? So it, that's really kind of exactly what the backup project does. So here we could just choose a new folder. And then at that point, we can give it a folder name and then just hit open. We could give it a name. You could choose to minimize audio files, hit OK if you needed to, and that would copy all of the files needed uh, into and consolidate to the newly defined folder that you just created. So try the backup project function. Okay, so we see a question. Uh, is there any way to fix or get a smoother stationary cursor auto scroll during playback? Mine is chunky, not sure how else to describe it. So sometimes when you're doing that, that could be kind of display driver related, but let me just, um, just open up kind of a big project and we'll put on stationary cursor. And this is like a you know two and a half year old MacBook that I'm running, but it'll just give you an idea. So you could check to see if your audio interface, is, you know, if you're uh, if you're on Windows, you know, try also, you know, enabling high DPI or disabling high DPI and see if that makes a difference. But I'll just kind of zoom in here, pretty a pretty good amount. And let's say as we're playing, and I'll put on stationary cursor. And I'll just kind of zoom in. Just kind of zoom out some more. We get to redraw really fast. So you know, if you're on Windows platform, sometimes if you go to the preferences to general, you know, and if you have like a 4K screen, try running it without that. You're realizing that every time that if you're, you know, if you're running at 4K at a resolution of like 1920 by 1080, that you're redrawing four pixels for every pixel, that may make a difference. But if you go to general, try, you know, and it's not on the Mac platform, but you'll see enable high DPI and see if that makes a difference. But I mean, it seems kind of function well and kind of as expected here on my system and in my PC for my personal studio. All right, so we see uh, uh, Traka is just saying my question was 400, maybe 400 characters long. Uh, how does some? So maybe if you just type in the question twice, you know, type the first half in and then the uh, second half, you could get it into two comments. All right, um, so I just see uh, from Kush, Kush Diara, also from San Diego, is uh, trying to use the MIDI remote mapping for the first time. It's supposed to be 
in learn mode, but knobs move, buttons work, but not the faders, not as easy as expected. All right, so I'll just do a brand new uh, MIDI remote. So I have a like a Choi Systems, Choi Sauce controller here. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'll set it up from scratch for you. All right, and let me disable the controller script. Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna add a new remote control. So I, this is an eight fader unit. So we'll just say, okay, from this, we want it to be um, all right, so I'm just going to add Choi Sauce. And we'll just call it a 100, just so it's different. Okay, and I'm going to be the script creator, and then I'm going to choose the MIDI in and out ports. Okay, and now I'm gonna create the MIDI control surface. So I'm gonna say, let's make our faders and I want my faders to be large like this. And now I move the fader, it gets automatically added, transmits the MIDI information. And then we have our eight faders. Uh, and now I could assign those to do uh, whatever function that I want it to do. So if we just kind of Double click, we could go directly into, you know, our mapping mode. So we can go to the mapping assistant for each of the faders and assign. So make sure that, you know, your actual device is transmitting MIDI data. But, you know, you can see how fast that was just kind of adding in the eight faders. So some controllers, maybe you have to hit a button. Like I think my Nectar, you have to hit a button between the faders and rotary encoders. You know, so it could be something like that. And you could check in, like, a, you know, if you add a MIDI track to that particular file and open up the MIDI monitor plugin. So let's say if I come here, let's add a MIDI track. Okay. And then we go to the MIDI inserts. You know, make sure that as, and you'll see a MIDI monitor. And as you transmit, you know, you could actually see what controllers are being transmitted by the unit itself. And make sure that it's actually spitting out MIDI information, so. through comments. Thanks for all the great questions. Sable Winters is, is, indicates that she slipped away for a few minutes and missed a troll. Dang. So Agent K and Jazz Dude are fast. So All right, so it just says, uh, hello, I just started a trial for Cubase 12, but have no idea how to route things. I currently use Reaper. Can anyone help with that? All right, so, you know, when we go to, you know, your studio menu to our studio setup, we can see that first thing we want to do is an audio system, select your audio driver there. Um, now, when you have available inputs and outputs, we just want to, at this point, uh, go to your audio connections and we go have an inputs and outputs tab. So if you have 16 inputs, you know, we could come right over here and just say, let's, you know, and this is where we could assign which input is going to, you know, so if I want, if I have two inputs, I could have those, you know, as two mono inputs or stereo input. So it's, it's no problem there to do that, you know, and whatever inputs that you have here, you could do. And then to set which input is going to which channel, you just come right over here to the top and then you could route 
uh, whatever input to your particular channels right there. So let me know if that makes sense. Okay, so we see a question. Uh, how can I build a Groove Agent kit of samples trimmed on the sample editor uh, without having to use the load instrument, which forces the kit to have the original project audio folder to be able to load? Okay, so, um, you know, if you wanted to do this, let's say I, I have a Groove Agent kit here. Let me just jump to another project. Revert this. Okay, so let's say we have um, just a groove agent. Okay, so let's say we have, I'll open up my instance of groove agent here. I'm just gonna cut the kit. Okay, so you know, if if we do this, we could have, you know, once we take you know, I could take a particular audio file in, and then, it, you know, if we wanted to just even, let's say if I just drag, I'm just gonna use like a range selection. So let's say on this hi-hat file, I'm, I'm gonna grab uh, just a range selection. So as we do this, I can now, we'll zoom in. So I'm gonna put this on, let's say F sharp one, hi-hat. So when we go to, you know, actually edit the particular sample. Uh, all right, so it's gonna kind of just play that back. So what I would do is, you know, really easily just come here and you can make a macro to do this. I would split. Sorry, I'll just cut the pad, all right, since I hit it a bunch of times. All right, so I would split, like hit Shift X, and that's gonna create a new, that's gonna basically just cut that file, and then just go to Bounce Selection. So, and we'll choose Replace Events, and now I will just take that, and now, at this point, we'll just have just that hi-hat. And let's say, okay, I want that hi-hat sample to end right there. So now this is a separate audio file than the entire audio file. And once we're done with that, just export, right click on the agent in Groove Agent and choose export kit with samples. And then that will automatically kind of save that particular sample and your original audio files are intact and you don't have to worry about you know, having the entire audio file that you just kind of uh, worked with. So let me know if that helps, Traka, Traka. All right, so we have uh, Raiz Rahim checking in. He's worried about being late, so no tardy slips here, so everyone's fine. See Agent K doing some some good moderation again. Thank you for that. It's a problem with having a popular live stream. Okay, so we see a uh, question. Uh, is this every Friday at this hour? So yeah, we start on Tuesdays and Fridays starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. Um, so it's 10 a.m. California time. I think Central Europe, it is 7 p.m., maybe 6 p.m. in the U.K. Um, and you can figure out, so if you go, like, you know, figure out from New York time, so U.S. Eastern time, 
Um, but yeah, we, and usually then on the last live stream of the month, we will have kind of a zoom meetup, like a little social thing, which is always fun. All right. We see Traka says, sweet. Do you just subscribed and make sure you hit the like button if you learn something new as well. So Neil is just saying he only bought the software after watching how well it is supported by Greg and the community. So it's great to hear. Thanks, Neil. All right, we see Phil just mentioning that unchecking the high DPI setting did seem to make it a little bit smoother on the stationary cursors. That's great to hear. All right, um, so we have a question. Uh, can I change the sample rate from 44.1 to 48 and the bit depth from 16 to 24 mid project or that mess up the files already recorded? Um, so no, no problem with that. Uh, you can, you can keep the original files and the easy way of doing this. And I think I just posted a tutorial video. It's just on the, it might've been released just yesterday on, on the Steinberg, U, on the Cubase YouTube channel. Um, but let me just come over. Okay, so let's say we have a project and let's say when we listen to it, we're gonna see our original audio files here are 44.1 16-bit, okay. So, you know, generally you could have multiple bit depths within the same project. So you have a 16, 24, 32-bit, 64-bit floating point file all within the same project, no problem. But if you wanted to convert this to 48K, and it's after the after the fact. If you need to do it, just go to the project setup, and then you'll see the sample rate here under record file format. So I'm going to switch this to 48k. At this point, I'll hit OK. Um, it says you want to convert the audio files to the new rate. So we'll say yes. And this is going to ask us: Do you want to keep the source files, the original files, in the pool? So I'll, I'll just choose keep. You know why not? So unless I'm really, really low on hard disk space. All right, so now do you wanna keep the audio events at their sample positions? We would choose no. So now all the files are gonna are at 48K and it's gonna play back the same exact pitch. And that's all you had to do to do a sample rate conversion. And if you wanted to take all the files and go to your pool window under media, here you could also just select these and if you wanted to um, convert files, we could just say, okay, we wanna keep the bit depth, we want to convert to 16 or 24 or 32. So, and there's no consequences of changing pitch with the bit depth, so. So you could do it mid project, no, no issues. All right, so we have a question. Uh, why is Dorco said like Dorco, like Dorco? Um, it's actually kind of an Italian, one of the early Italian notation, uh, like music engravers, like one of the first persons that was doing, uh, doing notation and kind of coming up with standards for musical notation was a guy named Dorco. Uh, so, you know, it's always, you know, so we had to pronounce it very Italian, Dorco, you know, so that's, that's where the, it was kind of the, uh, you know, sometimes the programs will have like a kind of like a project name and then, you know, they got so used to working in the project name, it just turned into the name of the product. So that's kind of the, or, the, the, the story there.
Okay, so you just see from Thomas says, uh, I'm in a session right now and Cubase won't find the aggregate device I made. It shows up in my Mac preferences, but not in audio connections. So once you create an aggregate device in Cubase on your Mac, you would just come over here, go to your device setup. And then at this point, you'd see the ASIO driver. At that point, you would see, um, once an aggregate device, you would see like, you know, aggregate audio device. So you need to set it there and then you'll see both audio devices available for input and output routing on Mac OS. Okay, sorry, my chat field jumped on me. So you see, uh, what's wrong with your AXR4's mic preamps? So n nothing wrong with them. So they tend to work well. All right, so I just see a comment, and I think it's directed to Jazz Dude. Uh, do you find that Windows performance with audio has become somewhat equivalent to the Mac, where Mac previously enjoyed the default 24-bit path? So, you know, I, th I don't think that there was ever a default 24-bit path on Mac or Windows. So just, you know, with that, I don't think there's a, a significant difference at all. So. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, how can I edit the vocal and harmony vox on the same screen at the same time using very audio? Okay, so I'll just go to a different project here. So you have one kind of active part and you could switch back and forth between them, but we'll show you how you could have them both visible and it's really easy to kind of switch so I'm going to take this and I'm going to create a quick chord track. All right, and I'll generate some harmony voices here. Do two harmonies. All right, so now I'm just going to select all three of these parts. Uh, let's, and go into sample editor and we'll just go kind of come over here to very audio. Okay, so we'll come to very audio here. So, um, so here we could see our multiple parts. Uh, and if we had these colorized, you know, we could colorize these. So let's say I had these on different colors. So now we'll, 
So now we could choose to colorize by event. So we could just kind of, so if we wanted to do editing, I could click here, do editing on this particular voice, or if I click here, you know, so as soon as you click on one of the voices, you could then do kind of all of the editing directly there. So if I say, okay, let's click on the first harmony voice, let's click on the main voice right there. That's how you could just kind of see all of your different parts within the very audio editor and do the editing like that. Okay, so we see Samson Strike. Uh, please help me understand monthly payment for my DAW. For example, five years that everything's gone. Incredible. Thanks, Steinberg, for not to do so as a future. Not do so in the future. Yeah, so we, we like, um, you know, I don't like renting any of my bases that I own or my gear, so I like to buy it and own it. So I think Steinberg is still, still likes that concept. And our customers keep telling us that. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, I'm coming across from FL Studio and FL. There's a current track which allows you to add specific VSTs for the currently selected track, which I use for metering. Um, can this be done in Cubase? All right, so. Okay, so. Um, okay, so. Um, so there's a current track which can always allows you to add specific via. Okay, so let me just think I, sorry, I think was, when I was reading it the first time, I may have misunderstood, but let me just jump to. Another project here. Right, so if you're doing a lot of metering stuff, you know, one of the things that you could do, um, you know, if you don't know this is, you know, as you route into Cubase, you know, everything could be kind of routed through like a control room. So as you play, you know, we have like the supervision plugin. So if you wanted to come here, you could just say, okay, like I wanted to have this metering. So everything could be here. Um, you know, if you wanted to, you could add, you know, create macros to add, uh, you know, specific track presets with that. But a lot of times, you know, if you're doing for metering, you know, we could have everything go through like the control room and do your metering points there. So we could, you know, change, you know, different types, uh, you know, multiple meter types that you could just enable right there. So if you're doing metering, that's a, a great solution, but if you wanted to add that across multiple tracks, you know, you could go to inserts if you needed a meter specifically on every track. If you enable quick link by holding down alt or option plus shift, uh, you could just say, I have all these tracks selected and I just wanted to add the supervision across all those particular tracks, you could do that. But, so let me know if that's helpful. And you could also drag and drop. All right, so we see best green Jesus is just, uh, you, you can, glue stacked MIDI events and not just side by side. Wow, thank you so much, that was exactly it. So glad that helped.
Okay, so we see a uh, question. Um, hello, everyone. My sound card does not have a headphone output. Is it possible to use both built-in output for headphones and sound card for main mix simultaneously? Uh, added feature suggestion. So, you know, most, you know, if, if you don't have, you, I guess you could route it through a headphone amp. Um, and if the headphone amp has a pass through, so it's not really a software limitation. It's really just kind of more of a hardware limitation if you don't have that. Um, so, you know, so it's not a feature suggestion. So I mean, you could check out like a UR interface and that could help you. All right, so we see from uh, Neil Conway, and I think this is with uh, stacking MIDI. So it says, does it crossfade? So if it's MIDI, you know, obviously crossfading isn't as applicable for MIDI data. So, but. All right, so I just see uh, at Greg, uh, I have a UR22 Mark II and the noise floor was high. Uh, what did you do to compensate for that? I never really found my noise floor to be high with that, you know, so I think the UR22 can have, uh, the Mark II um, can have a balance knob so that you could, you know, blend between the incoming monitored source versus what's coming off. So make sure you have that balance knob kind of set and try adjusting that but it's it's a very quiet interface uh, i know lots of people that do like you know mission critical government audio recording sessions with it and you know where it where it really uh where it really matters with noise floor and don't have any problems with it at all so Okay, so I see, I would like to know, question, I would like to know when Cubase 12 can be compatible with old VST3 plugins without using Rosetta mode. Um, so, you know, if you're on an M1 processor, we, we don't make the, you know, you know, if it's a VST3 plugin that's not M1 native, you know, we can't make that plugin M1 native. Uh, so it had to be run in uh, Rosetta mode if it's, you know, but, Basically, VST2 plugins um, will need to be run in Rosetta mode, and VST2 has really, um, you know, it's been 2008 when VST3 was released. So uh, most companies, you know, are updating. So, and it's, you know, it's like we're not going to work on Windows 95 software. Or we're not going to work on, you know, Windows XP software at this point. So there's a lot of companies that, you know, have had 14 years to update. So, you know, if they're still doing VST2 plugins, you know, it's really kind of up to those companies to make that work. So, but VST3 plugins can work M1 natively, but, you know, it could be a VST3 plugin and not be M1 compatible. And it's just kind of out of our control it's really up to the plugin developers to get compatibility. Thank you, Agent K and Jazz dude for their their active moderation today. Sorry about that. Okay, so we have, um, so you just see from Best Screen Jesus, I have an issue with Groove Agent panning all sounds instead of just one. Uh, is the best course to dissolve and do it that way? So if it is doing, um, so let's say, I'll jump to a different project. So it's not like in, uh, I don't think Groove Agent is set up as kind of like an MPE, like MIDI 2.0 2 type of thing. But let me just give it a shot here. But you might just automate directly instead of, you might automate each pad independently within the actual plugin. So let's say if we.
Okay, so let's say we come here. All right, so like in this one, So let me just All right, so let's say I wanted to take this hi-hat and automate the panning. So you may not do it from the MIDI editor, but automating within the plugin itself. So let's say uh, I'll just play. And let's go ahead and I'll just take the hi-hat panning. All right, now let's come over here and I'm just gonna rewind. So my hi-hat is still panning independently. So, you know, you could pan, you know, so it's not set up where, um, I don't think Groove Agent is set up where each note could be like double clicked on to open like the note expression editor. Um, but every sound can be panned independently using just, just automating the particular uh, pan controls for each pad. So let me know if that helps. Okay, so we see question, uh, does UR24C uh, have speed problems on USB 3 on PC systems? There is a form of device from Steinberg to use USB 2 instead. I thought the URC version is advertised to use with the faster USB 3. So when it was first released, and this is two, three years ago, you know, many of the systems wouldn't support, many, many systems wouldn't actually support USB 3 speeds. You know, and that was kind of when it was initially recent, and this could be three and a half, maybe even four years ago, uh, when they were first released. So, but as systems have been updated, they most of them are supporting that. But when it was first released, we just wanted to make sure that it was compatible with USB 2 as well, because there's when we first released it, you know, 98% of the people were on USB 2. So as it's become more commonplace and USB 3 is more resident on motherboards, I don't think it's that much of a problem. I've always run it on high speed on my computers. And I have one that's nine or 10 years old. One of my uh, standard uh, you know, computers I take out for demos when I'm traveling. So I haven't had any problems with it. So, and sometimes Yamaha can be very conservative, you know, to say, okay, you know, there's 0.075% of people will run into this. So we're gonna give a warning message just in case, so. Yes, we see Michael Teen saying, nice shooting to Agent K and Jazz Dude. Yeah, they've been busy today. So we appreciate um, Okay, so we have a question. Uh, how do I smooth my sine waves when I'm drawing in automation? Okay, so let's go take a look. Okay, so let's switch our drawing tool. Let's say to sine. All right, so as we do this, you know, we could, if I just hold down um, all right, so let me just, we 
get my modifier key right. All right, so here, um, I'm just gonna kind of drag this across. So as we, so as I start to draw it in, a point, let me just get my, So just if you hold down the shift key, this could kind of set the frequency of it. So, and if I wanted to hold down the shift key, we could just come right over here and just kind of draw in and change the frequency of that. And then as we wanted to, you know, hold down the uh, command key, we could kind of change the placement of where the sine wave starts. So give that a try. So shift key to change the frequency. And then we have the uh, command and control to actually choose at what, at what point in the sine wave you want the automation to start. And then you could just kind of draw it in and then you could move it up or down as well to adjust kind of the amplitude of the wave. So let me know if that helps. See Nick just indicating if we can spam the spammers with ice cream and soup. So I like the nice guy approach. So okay, so we see. Uh, is there a way to disable the volume control in control room? I still want to use the other control room functions, but I use a hardware monitor controller. Um, so you could do that. I mean, you know, if you don't want to use, um, you know, the volume control, you know, once you have the level set, you could, you know, you could set it to kind of this known volume level and then just don't change it from there. And then you could still use your monitoring control. So, you know, if you don't have anything that's remotely controlling it, you could just leave it at that particular uh, volume level and then use your monitor controller if you need it to, like if you don't have enough outputs on your audio interface or you want to use your monitor controller and still route everything through there and just don't adjust the volume. Uh, and then you get all the benefits of the, of the control room as well, so. All right, so we see Michael Teams is granted one gallon of cordial cherry ice cream to best Korean Jesus. That's very nice. All right, um, so it says, uh, hey Greg, a few days ago, I had to add silence to uh, one to three seconds before or after recording. Uh, is there a quick way? Okay, so let's say if we have a recording in, okay, I'll just do a new project here. All right, so say I need to add um, 
All right, so let's say I'll put this into seconds. So let's see if I just select before and out of the range. Let's see if bounce selection does this. Yeah, so if you just extend beyond, if you used a range selection tool and extend before and after the event and then go to audio, I didn't know if that would work or not, and but some smart Steinberg programmers and we'll choose to replace and then that will extend silence before and after the particular event. I like that. The developers of the company I represent are really good and think of stuff like that. Makes me look good. But kudos goes to them. Um, so we see this is a question about the creating like little drum samples in Groove Agent. Uh, so does that mean I can use that kit in other projects and won't need the original audio folder from the original project? Um, so yeah, you should you won't need the original audio. So find my spot. Sorry, I just try to find my Okay, reading through, and again, we have to give special thanks to Agent K and Jazz Dude for their tireless work and their moderation. Okay, so we see um, I upgraded my Cubase Pro 10 to Nuendo 11, but my Cubase has been deactivated. Uh, how can I reactivate it again? So if you did uh, in kind of an upgrade from Cubase to, to Nuendo, at that point it's going to, you know, your Cubase license is transform, transformed into a, a Nuendo license. So, and that's why you kind of get, got the discount in doing it. So you're not buying a new separate Nuendo license. You're upgrading your Cubase license to Nuendo. Um, but your Nuendo can just simply open up all your Cubase projects. So it shouldn't be a problem with that. So. See Race Raven just saying supervision looks awesome, didn't even know about it. So it's it's a probably one of the best uh metering plugins around, so definitely check that out.
right? So we see uh, instead of adding supervision across all tracks, can I have one instance of supervision that changes input based on my currently selected track? Um, so I don't think it does that, but you could, um, I think you could side chain input. So let's come here to activate this. All right, so let's come over here, I'll just run it. So let's say now I just wanted to go to kick. And then you could just say, okay, instead of this, I want it to go to. And then you, I think you could just kind of switch like your sidechain input there as well. But as you would solo tracks, you could also just, you know, so if we have this, is soloed here. So let's say, okay, now I just want to solo bass. So you could, as you solo tracks, and a lot of people have this up on just a dedicated monitor as well. So once you kind of get into it, it's it's hard to go back to other monitoring devices, metering. Uh, so he says, hey, Greg, do you get paid uh, for all the nice hard work you're doing on the live stream? So it's part of my job. Um, so, you know, but I you know, I think I just get free software, but just kidding. But yeah, it's, it's part of my job responsibility. So um, I, I kind of migrated to doing this because I thought it was an effective way of, especially during pandemic, I used to be the guy that traveled and would fly 120,000 miles a year, kind of like up in the air, kind of travel, you know, I'd fly to LA from the East Coast for a day and fly back that night. Um, but I think doing the live streams is a more effective way to reach people. Okay, just reading through comments here. Let's see how we're doing on time. Okay, doing pretty well. All right, we see Best Green Jesus. So you could do that in automation lane and, and not the drum map MIDI. Does that make sense? And it solves its issues. That's great.
All right, so this is uh, from Best Screen Jesus. Uh, when you lay the curves down, it's smooth. Mine looks low res and sharp and jagged. I was wondering if it's a setting for smoothing the curves or something I need to adjust. Thanks, Greg. You know, it could be maybe a display issue, but, you know, see how it sounds is the most important thing. You know, I know sometimes uh, there's lots of people do mixing and they, you know, draw on your LFOs and it's like, oh, you know, and they do all this you know, very fine editing and they play back, you know, it was like, you know, did you really hear a difference between what you spent 10 minutes creating versus what you had before? So I would always kind of go by ears and see if it sounds smooth. That'd be like the important thing, obviously, I think. All right, so we see uh, Ray's Rabins as uh, thanks for the answers, and he's looking forward to the first Zoom call at month's end. Yeah, so uh, the first, just we may do it like the second to the last, uh, like May 27th or something like that. Uh, the week of May 31st and the first week of June, I'll be at the NAM show, so we may not have live streams that week because I'll be with involved with the NAM show, but I'll let people know as we get closer, so. All right, uh, so we uh, have a question. Is it possible to send a drum kit I've saved to another Cubase user? Yeah, so as soon as you go into like a, a instance of Groove Agent, you know, like a Groove Agent kit that you've made, just come right over here and you could do the export kit with samples. Uh, and if you're, you know, and then at that point you could freely save that. Um, you know, with other users as well. So you could just mail, email the files over. Okay, so I think I've almost caught up and I know we had a lot of questions that were sent in. So let me get to some of those. Okay, so we see uh, Neil Conway just says, um, yeah, about his question about the noise floor and UR22. So I, I did go through it to make sure you know, check, you know, because a lot of times there is the the balance knob. When you go to the UR22 Mark II, there's the balance knob. And make sure that that is set. And that allows you to monitor the incoming signal versus, uh, you know, the signal coming from the computer. So, you, you know, check that. But, you know, um, and as I mentioned previous, you know, a little while before, which um, you may have missed, was you know just that it is used in a lot of very mission critical stuff. So I think the noise floor is really good. But check kind of the, um, let's see if we could just find a picture of it real quick, so we could share it with everyone. So when you have this mix knob, try adjusting that mix knob. You know, you could start with it in the center and see if that adjusts things as well. But sometimes, but it's really a very low noise uh, unit. But if it, that is kind of out of whack, um, you know, that may, may be adjusting things. And, you know, whatever input you're plugging into, into imp, if you're plugging into input two, make sure if it's a, you know, if it's a guitar bass that you have the high Z input on. If not, then just simply turn off the uh, high Z um, switch because that's just kind of altering the impedance, the impedance to match for like guitar or bass. OK, 
Okay. All right, so let me go to some of the questions mailed in. So once again, thanks for all the great questions. And if you've learned something, make sure that you do hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure you actually uh, do that as well. All right. So let me get to my Word document here. Okay. Um, so question, will you explain in detail for me and other beat makers and music producers the art of 5.1 and 7.1 surround sound recording and mixing in Cubase? You know, so generally most things aren't captured and recorded in 5.1, uh, but how it works is, let's say if I wanted to, uh, if I go to, let's just jump back to Cubase, make it active window. So when we go to our audio connections, what I want to do is go to my 5.1 output. So ideally, you know, like with 5.1, you'd want to have, you know, five of the same type of speakers and uh, or six, you know, or five of the same type of speakers. So a center channel, left and right, left and right surround and a LFE or subwoofer. So once you have an output, there, we want to make sure that all the tracks are being sent to 5.1 output. Um, and once you do that, at that point, you could just double click on the panner, and now you could take the signal, instead of just going into the left or right channel, we could pan it in kind of a circular fashion. Now, if you wanted to do more Dolby Atmos, we could also uh, you know, create a Dolby Atmos mix, and the difference between traditional kind of surround sound and Dolby Atmos is that Dolby Atmos as, adds channels for height. So as we um, just simply, you know, want to take something that sounds like it's low in front of us to be high in front of us, we could have height channels. So this way you could mix, you know, predominantly in 5.1. So like in the early, late 90s, there was a big movement of, remixing many records and releasing records mixed in 5.1. We now kind of have resurgence with Dolby Atmos, and then you could basically, you know, have more sound feel to work with. But the gotcha, and the problem is that many people can't really effectively listen to 5.1 or to a Dolby Atmos, and it has to be kind of, you know, run through binaural decoding and stuff like that. So but that will help get you started with that. Okay, so question, uh, my MIDI connections, I'm currently using the Motu 128 Express. What are the benefits of using the MIDI connections of the UR816 audio interface? So you could think of it as an additional MIDI port. Some people will like to have the same MIDI port. And if you're doing synchronization with a word clock, like if you're doing external synchronization, it's not as popular as it was 20 years ago. Um, that way you could take the MIDI time code source at, and the, uh, and the word clock from the same device. And that can make things a little easier, but think of the extra, you know, just think of it as an, an extra 16 MIDI channels for external devices. So, okay. Question, uh, in my Cubase control room menu, I have a left and right speaker configuration. I want to add my subwoofer to monitor one bus. Do I have the option of adding the subwoofer to the monitor one bus, or do I have to create a new bus for the three speaker setup? So most of the people when running a subwoofer and probably, you know, for a 2.1 setup, the probably the best way most subwoofers will actually do its own crossover. So what most people will do is take the stereo out into the subwoofer uh, and then the left and right outputs to the speakers out of the sub into the speakers and use that. So that's probably the preferred method, but there isn't a way just to add kind of a sub bus. You could uh, create a 5.1 output and not define the actual... Um, you know, the surround or center channels, but that could treat the LFE crossovers differently uh, for like a 5.1 or an Atmos versus a stereo 2.1 monitoring. So you're probably better off actually 
probably the proper way to do it is to take the outputs from your interface to stereo outs into your subwoofer and have the crossover handled there. So that's why you often pair the subwoofers with the speakers for that particular reason. All right, um, is it possible to rename, question, is it possible to rename each of the three mixing consoles in Cubase Pro 11 to reflect the different mixes created? Um, so they will always kind of, the, na the names of the mix consoles will always, you know, be fixed. Um, so there, you know, but if you kind of know what's in mix console two, three or four, uh, you know, most people don't have to rename it if you've taken the time to kind of set up the different configurations for the mix consoles. You know, just simply opening them will reflect those changes. So there isn't a way to rename the actual mix consoles. Okay, so we see a uh, question. Is there a list available for the note values in the form of ticks for Cubase? Example, a 16th note equals 60 ticks. Um, so when we look at like the MIDI resolution, so let me just quickly add a part. So one of the things in Cubase is the MIDI timing is sample accurate. So unlike a lot of uh, different types of, pro of sequencers, let's see if it's gonna, make my system crawl here for a second. So, but it is sample accurate. So it's not a fixed resolution of like 480 or 960. It's, you know, it could be one 192 thousandth of a second. So, and you could adjust how many divisions uh, in the MIDI preferences. Let me see if this is gonna, if I get this back here real quick. If not, I will. Sometimes some instruments take a while to load up for some reason. If not, I will just shut it down real quick. All right, let me just see if I can shut it down real quick here. All right. So there's not a, a specific list because it is variable. So you could have it be, you know, any MIDI division that you want. You know, so the old days when, uh, you know, sequencers had a, like, you know, like Cubase for a while was 384 PPQ, like on the Atari days. Uh, so as we worked with different stuff like that, um, but it's, there's no real fixed value. So when we come here, um, we go to, let's say our preferences, and then it's probably under MIDI. So we could say our default 16th note is 120, but as we change this, we can see that the PPQ base will change. Um, so as we look at this and we go to a MIDI event, so let me just add a quick instrument track here. So when we see this uh, this position, you know, we see our measure, our beat, and then we have our 16th note division here. Uh, so this would be our 16th note, and then we could have the 120 divisions, which is the default setting. So we could have just this as our 16th notes right here, this third number. So that's the 16th note resolution there. All right, so I had a question. How do you do curves in automation lanes, like a Bezier curve? All right, so let's come over here. Let's say I have this automation point and I just wanted to draw a curve. So let's say I just wanted to, you know, even just do a quick automation bump here, like so. So once I've created a curve between two points where there's gonna be uh, like a ramp, if we just hover in the center of that ramp, we can now just come right over here and create your Bezier curves like so. So just kind of any value that has a difference. So if I wanted to zoom in here, let's say in this curve area here, I could just do a curve right 
directly there. So. All right, so we had a question from uh, Ari from Israel. So it says, uh, since I upgraded to Cubase 12 uh, FX many times, I load effect into the insert and it is stuck. I can I can only delete it with the delete on a keyboard. Can't use another effect instead in the same place. Uh, I have positive, positive grid guitar effects. And when I drag many times, Cubase 12 suddenly shuts down completely. So it could be an issue with that particular plugin. Let me see. If I come here, I'll just grab some effects. Um, so let's say I drag over my brick wall limiter. Okay, I come here, I have this. Uh, I wanted to drag this compressor over. Um, so it's just kind of, and if I wanted to get rid of plugins, I could just drag it out directly like so and so once I do that, then it's all gone. So if you have, if you notice that it's always going to be the positive grid, uh, you know, guitar effects, then, um, you know, it could be, you know, some incompatibilities there. So you may want to check with them on that, but see if you get the same thing with, without other plugins. All right, so a question. Uh, I own Cubase 11 Pro and Patchop Pro purchased independently. What will happen to the Patchop Pro license when I install Patchop 2, the license of which came with Cubase? Uh, will the Patchop Pro license irreversibly change to Patchop 2 on my e licensor? Uh, in that case, uh, what if for some reason the time machine to roll back my system to a previous state? Uh, will the license of Patchop become corrupted or will it correctly be reverted to Patchop? Pro again. Uh, my system is a Mac Pro late 2013 trash can with Mojave. So if you have the license on your e-licensor, um, that will always be on your e-licensor. So if we have, um, you know, and there's, okay, so you have Cubase 11 Pro. So your Cubase 11 Pro has the license on the e-licensor and the, if you have, if you bought the Pad Shop 2 separately, then that light, that's a separate license on your e-licensor as well. So if you update it, you know, if, if you, you know, had to completely reinstall everything, you just reinstall and you don't have to do any license activations because both licenses will be on your e-licensor. If you upgrade your Cubase 11 Pro to Cubase 12, the pad shop license will be available as part of Cubase Pro 12 with on the new Steinberg licensing system. Um, so, but it'll always, you know, remain on your USB e licensor. Okay, so we see question on hybrid mixing analog delay compensation. Uh, what if the ping delay measure isn't working properly? Uh, I'm getting 0, 0.00 milliseconds and sometimes 0, 0.01 milliseconds when the delay is measured through my Drummer 1978 via Focusrite Claret 8 Pre. Uh, surely that is incorrect because I'm hearing slight comb filtering or phasing. How do I fix or test to get an accurate delay measure? Um, so the one thing I would check, and I've seen a lot of people run into this, is when they're doing the pinging that they actually are running through uh, direct monitoring and sometimes that would just basically pass the signal directly to the output. So make sure that you go to the studio setup that you don't, for your Claret, that you don't have direct monitoring turned on or direct monitoring enabled within probably like a little mixer applet or a little mixer program for the Claret. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, hi, Greg, uh, I have a big project here. Um, how big a Cubase project has Greg seen number of tracks? Um, so I think at Michael, I've seen composers with seven, 800 tracks. Um, I think I saw Danny Lux project and might've had like 1200. Uh, and he does like Grey's Anatomy and a lot of other TV shows and his templates around 4,000. Um, I think Bear McCrillis has... I think I saw a project of his on a Zoom that was maybe about 1,200 tracks. Uh, I've seen 
like Michael Wagner have several hundred tracks. I remember one project he showed me he had like 12 different kick drums and like 18 snare mics all all going at once. So, you know, that's not uh, unheard of. So, um, and question, has Greg heard or seen extreme huge Cubase projects with numbers, screens, DAW stations, et cetera, you can tell us about? So let me see if I can find just a quick picture um, of my friend Jim Corgan's room. And he's sometimes on the live streams. I can't remember if it's Heart Light or Heartland Studios. You just see, um, and I think he has like nine different display monitors. Let me see, this is Jim here. You may not be able to see it. Yeah, so this is so that was the picture there. So that's pretty cool. Um, I think someone else who's also sometimes on the hangout in Los Angeles. I think it's Cockpit Studios. This is kind of cool. but he has a massive display. So you can see that kind of set up there. That's, um, that's his studio. So he has kind of, it looks like six screens going across. And so he has nine screens as well. So. Those are pretty cool rooms. Uh, I don't have enough space for that in my studio, but just to give you an idea. All right, um, so we have a question. Uh, I have an old Roland FC200 guitar MIDI foot controller with, with 10 foot switches. Is it possible to set this up to trigger key commands and macros in Cubase 12? Uh, for example, I have foot switch one assigned to record, switch two to macro two, et cetera, which I could control Cubase, uh, recording guitars away from my computer keyboard. So yeah, you could do this uh, directly with the MIDI remote. So let's say you wanted to just come here. Um, all right, so I'll just... Okay, and basically you, you have an input and output connected to your computer. All right, so we'll create, so I just wanted to make, let's say buttons. And then what you need to do is just kind of hit the buttons here and that will automatically populate um, the different controls. So as soon as we I think I already have that being used. Um, so, but as, and then as soon as we, so you hit the buttons and then they would be populated, but let's come over here. And so you may have something that kind of looks like this. I will define
So I'll just make this larger so we could see it a little easier. So I will, at this point, just say, so we could define kind of the different uh, modes here. And then once we go to the mode, you could just, inside of Cubase, you could select the particular button and you could just hit the button here and say, I, I want this to record and then right click on the function and you can say pick up for MIDI remote. Uh, and then we could just say, okay, we're gonna apply the mapping. And that's how you could just assign. So just capture, so just kind of feed into the MIDI remote. Uh, and then you could define like those 10 buttons for whatever functions you want in Cubase. All right, question. Uh, is there any difference between a laptop versus desktop with the same processor and amount of RAM? I haven't really done any critical AB tests, but I think, you know, sometimes you may have like a mobile processor that may not be as fast as a dedicated uh, hardware CPU. Obviously, I think those lines are shrinking between the two of them. Um, but you know, hardware will, could give you some more advantages for adding additional hard drives internally, you know, adding NVMe drives, uh, adding, you know, DSP expansion, you know, could, so that could give you some more flexibility. But I think in terms of raw processing power that, you know, you could do great with the laptop now. All right, uh, so we see, uh, hi Greg, can you please tell me what are some of the best stock plugins to use to get a great professional sounding master? Uh, also, can you show me a quick example of how to set it up in the DAW for master example, uh, a three song EP? All right, so let's say I just wanted to do a new project here. All right, so let's say, you know, so a lot of times I per personally use WaveLab for mastering, but you know, a lot of people, if you're just considering mastering kind of the processing, um, I will just come over here, let's say, I think I just did a, so if I want to do some quick mastering on something, So let's say I want to take the Beatles or Stones track. I don't think that's the right one. Let me try again. Okay, so let's say if I wanted to take this, let me just. Switch this real quickly, sorry about that. All right, so let's say I wanted to do like some mastering, like, or, you know, so if you wanted to just kind of run it through some processes, um, so some really good ones I would consider. You know, maybe like the frequency EQ. And what's kind of cool about this is as you EQ, you could just kind of isolate. If you have this button turned on, we could just isolate particular frequencies. And then I could also have this work on the stereo or I could EQ the left and right channel. So that's the way I'm only EQing the left or only the right. So you could get like really surgical or you could say I wanted this just to do uh, mid and side. So if I wanted to pan the middle part of the panning spectrum or I wanna make the edges brighter. So that's a, kind of a great plug-in for that, and there's probably um, 
you know, like just different mastering presets that you could use. So let's just. Uh, I may go into like a multi-band compressor is always very really nice. And this would allow you to kind of boost and compress different frequencies independently. So if you wanted to only hear And Imager is wonderful because we could choose to take my high frequencies here and make those wider. And you could get even more creative with like squasher. So that would be, you know, like, and you could work with different mastering chains and every song <clears throat> will be unique. But, you know, try some multi-band compression, you know, like a squasher is great. <clears throat> Frequency for surgical EQ and maybe the imager to kind of take different frequencies and make, you know, the highs wider and the lows a little more mono-esque. And you can come up with some great results for that. All right, so got a question. It was kind of uh, emailed in and this is, um, and this kind of came with a, Siri, like, I think it was from Sven, and he had sent a video of, like, some, like, suggestions for, uh, like, with the MIDI remote. Um, and one of the ones that, you know, I know he sent a video with it. And, you know, so let's say if I had a particular project here, and one of the things was the, customer, the person doing the remote had, like, a Mackie control. And one of the age old, you know, limitations of the Mackie control protocol. And it's, you know, almost, you know, almost 30 years old now is that it's going to, uh, you can't have the Mackie control select, you know, follow the track selection in the mixer. So one of the things that you can do to, and one of the things in the video that was kind of brought up is a weakness of the MIDI control. And it's really not a weakness of the MIDI control, but a weakness of the Mackie control uh, paradigm is when we go to the MIDI remote and I go to my Nectar here, you can have, when we go to the mapping editor, uh, one, of the, one of the distinctions you could have is like, you know, if I wanted this to always be, this one fader to always be the volume regard on the selected channel. So when we do this, we could actually go to the selected track. And on this, I have the volume for a selected track and I could have the input. So I could have whatever, so if I wanted to set up one fader to always be the volume and the, the, the potentiometer above it to do panning or to do aux send one and I want it for the selected channel uh, we could just set it up here for the selected track so when I come over here we could just say okay I have that track selected my my one control fader is controlling that I select this track it's controlling that so whatever track is selected is automatically getting controlled so um you know, so as a feature suggestion, you know, it's like if it's in Mackie control, it's going to be limitations with that. But with this, you could automatically just take whatever track is selected and that same fader will automatically control that particular parameter. And you could do that for panning, aux sends, et cetera. So, um, and there are some other suggestions about like sending time code out to the device, but you know. Um, we may see some, you know, I'll, I'll bring it up to their attention, but I don't think that was the primary function of seeing the time code 
on your controller and there's obviously like to indicate different states and some of that stuff may come and we have to realize that the MIDI remote control is kind of really like a first generation thing and it's incredibly complete kind of for how it's set up and configured now. All right, let me jump back to the live questions. Thanks everyone for all their wonderful questions. So let me just mute that and I'll go back to our live. So thanks for all the live questions as well. So let me just jump back. Okay, just reading through comments and finding my spot. Okay, reading through comments, so lots of great discussion. Okay, so Michael Team saying he learns a lot every time the stream is on. So we see, uh, just, I just see a question is directed to Jazz Dude. Uh, will Nuendo recognize an, an NPR file without the suffix change? So yeah, Cubase can open up, you know, .NPR and CPR files, and Nuendo can open .CPR and .NPR files as well. Okay, so we just see from uh, Ray Mitchell. Hi there, I need help setting up headphone cue mixes and could really use a bit of one-on-one -on -one help to talk it through. How can I contact you directly? Um, so, you know, if you wanted to reach out to Club Cubase at steinberg.de, you could do that as well. But I'll, I'll take a quick look at the headphone mixes uh, if you want. So let's say in this case we have like bass, drums, and guitar. So I we can just go to our connections here and go into the control room. And then we could add cue mixes. So once we go to the cue mixes, um, so let's say I have drums, bass, guitar as cue mixes. And ideally we want these sent to different outputs that could be routed to headphone outs on our audio interface or headphone out or outputs that could be routed to a headphone amplifier. So, uh, so I want to come here and let's go into our large mix console. So we come and I want to select all of my channels in the project. And what I want to do 
is right click in the control room. So we're gonna make sure that the control room is active and we'll see all cues. So I want to activate the cue sends. And I wanna use the current mix levels. And let's use the current pan settings as well. And in the racks, we're gonna make sure that Q sends right here is active. So we're gonna open up our cues. And what we want to do is send more drums, let's say to our drummer's headphone mix. So I'm gonna come here, I'm gonna activate Q link, and we'll say, okay, more drums go to the drums. More bass goes to the bass headphone mix, and more guitar goes to the more guitar headphone mix. So as we're listening to this, I'll just fast forward a little bit here. All right, so now if we want to listen to our cue mixes, we could just come right over here. So we can say, And at that point, you could just say, okay, we're gonna listen to just, um, you know, cue mixes here on this one, and we could just switch between the different cue mixes right there. So, you know, and there's a couple of videos on doing cue mixes and setting up on the Cubase channel as well, but give that a shot. Let's see, we've got a couple more minutes before we wrap up for the weekend. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Again, if you've learned something new, make sure you do hit the like button. All right, so we see Liam Taylor joining us. So. See Kevin Mehmed's writing more lyrics. That's great. All right, great to see Spike Williams on the live stream from Wales. All right, so we see question, uh, when will the newest update of WaveLab happen? How long will it drop? So usually we don't announce stuff uh, before it's released, so we'll just have to kind of wait and see. See John Marshall is saying auto listen on frequency is super handy. As well as mid-side and the dynamics. So we see uh, Sable saying thanks for the EQ, et cetera, answer this question without asking for Beatles and Stones in advance. All right. We're all anxious to hear your version of it, Sable. All right, so we see Michael Teams has got another revelation of the day. All right.
All right, so see, I think we might be kind of at time. We'll give it in our minute or so, see if there's any other questions that come in. All right, so once again, we'll be doing this on Tuesday, starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Uh, I want to give a special thanks because uh, Agent K and Jazz Dude had to do a lot of moderation today. I apologize for that, so it must mean we have a popular live stream. Uh, but I appreciate you guys being so on top of that, and I know it makes it so much better for the community. Uh, but we just um, – so we'll see – Every I want everyone to have a wonderful and safe – and healthy weekend. Uh, enjoy the spring weather if you're in the northern hemisphere and autumn weather if you're in the southern hemisphere. And we will see everyone again on Thursday. So thank you. And, or we'll see everyone on Tuesday. So thanks. Have a wonderful weekend. Take care.